With a few months remaining till Shadow of the Earth 3 launches, it might be time to dive back in the world of Elden Ring. Whether it's to captivate that feeling again of when you first started playing Elden Ring, or just to prepare and have a character ready for the DLC, I've got you covered. I made a get OP early build for every class in the game that fits the background story and class identity of each class, and each build is so broken, you will destroy the game with ease. And in this video, we're going to go over all of these builds, get OP early routes and strategies, combat strategies to completely dominate, optimal status distributions, getting a lot of useful stuff at the start of the game, everything really. We're going to start off with the Vagabond and go through my builds and associated get OP early strategies in order of how the classes are presented in the menu. These builds are all up to date by the way and I've also timestamped the video so you can easily navigate through the video and after popular demand I have now also made written guides of all my classic Elden Ring builds including the ones in this video. So if that's your cup of tea then check my Patreon out or if you just want to support the channel but otherwise make sure to subscribe to not miss out on on Shadow of the Earth Tree Epicness. We're going to get into this monster of a video real quick. But first, this video is brought to you by Manscaped.com, the one and only man's lifestyle brand that has taken care of over 20 million balls. Today I'm showing off a top-notch quality bundle product known as the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra, which comes with a lawnmower, first of all, and this thing takes grooming precision to a whole new level with their next-gen dual skin safe blade heads, existing of an upgraded trimmer blade which features longer, wider, and rounded teeth that cut elegantly through hair with ease, and the revolutionary foil blade is designed to leave you with a finish that is irresistibly sleek and utterly bare. Start your trimming session using the trimmer blade, then easily pop it off and attach the foil blade to top it off yourself. These two are an amazing duo. The Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra also has a bigger LED light to lighten up obscure areas and introduces a brand new dual temperature feature thoughtfully engineered to embrace and flatter multiple skin tones. And yes, this piece is also waterproof like all the classic Manscaped products. The bundle then also comes with also waterproof the Weed Whacker 2.0 and this bad boy is designed to tackle those no and ear hairs with ease. And finally, we have the Crop Soother and the Crop Preserver to elevate your self-care routine. The Crop Soother provides you essential moisture and soothing relief, while the Crop Preserver is a ball deodorant to keep the funk at bay. If you buy the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra right now, you get two gifts, the Boxers 2.0, which comes with an exclusive pouch, and the Shed 2.0, which keeps all your gear organized. Head over to manscaped.com to get your hands on the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra today. When you use my promo code, you'll get 20% off, plus free international shipping, plus two free gifts. So check it out, your balls will thank you. A strength and dexterity hybrid build is one of those builds in Elden Ring that many people just simply do not seem to believe in. Because why give yourself the headache and not just go for a pure strength or a pure dexterity build? They're both physical damage related stats, right? Well, the Vagabond is here to answer that question for you and is the living proof that strength and dexterity combined works well, very well even. Add to that that the setup the Vagabond uses might not only be the best strength and dexterity setup in the game, it may even be nominated for the best setup in the game in general. The Vagabond is not just defined by his hybrid nature of having strength and dexterity at the same time though. The Vagabond is also known for being extremely tanky and having everlasting sustain and that's needed because the world turned on the Vagabond. The Vagabond was exiled from his homeland and ever since has been alone in the world, giving a necessity to survive completely independently. Some people may call the Vagabond an outcast, a loner, the lowest of the lowest that is not even wanted in his own homeland and therefore is said to just be a failure in this world. Almost an analogy for how strength and dexterity hybrid builds may set up to be a failure built in Elden Ring as well. But every story has two sides. People who can look beyond the shallow social constructions that society sets upon us and see with their own eyes what the Vagabond is truly capable of will quickly come to the realization that the Vagabond is a self-made powerhouse and doesn't need anyone to succeed in the world. See, the Vagabond is the definition of a juggernaut, because the Vagabond destroys everything and everyone that dares to challenge him with his insane weapon and combat skills while having so much tenacity, sustain and tankiness at the same time, making it impossible for the Vagabond to ever die in combat. This is my get OP early guide for the Vagabond and the most powerful strength and dexterity build in Elden Ring.
Now when you choose the Vagabond as your starting class, you'll see that thematically and functionally it is the class for a strength and dexterity hybrid build as they are the Vagabond's highest damaging stats. This is also known as a quality build. Quality being a fancy way to say that you scale your damage output through both the physical damage related sets in the game, namely strength and dexterity at the same time. At the same time it's also the class with the highest starting points in Vigor in Eldering, setting up nicely for the tanky side of the Vagabond and thematically giving us a reason to make our Vagabond a juggernaut type of build. All things considered, the Vagabond has one of the best starting stat distributions in the game and that is nice obviously. The equipment you get as the Vagabond isn't bad at all either, you get a shield and two weapons. Your longsword reflects your dexterous side, while the halberd shows the strength side of the Vagabond and that he's capable of operating heavier weapons. The ashes of wars that come on these weapons are fun as well to use and they are definitely decent for killing stuff. But nice and decent just don't cut it for the Vagabond. After 10 minutes of playing around with this kid stuff, we want to start working on the most powerful Vagabond, the best and most powerful strength and dexterity build. We want OP, amazing, extraordinary, exceptional, you name it. So that's exactly what we're going to make right now, and you can safely throw away the starting equipment, no need for that stuff anymore. Now before you continue, make sure to give the video a like and hit that subscribe button if you still haven't done so yet. I know you want to, make sure to hit those buttons. Now let's do the general get OP early basics to give us a great start regardless of our build. For this, go to the gate front side of Grace to get your mount for Melina. And after getting them out, we can now finally move around with some pace. Then go to the second caravan down the road from where you just spoke Molina. In this caravan there will be a chest at the back side. Loot it and you will get the flail. Furthermore, you want to get a golden pickled fowl food. You can get one quite close to the starting area right here in Limgrave. After doing so, go to the third church of America. Pick up the goodies that are laying around here for you to pick up. And then go beyond the church and take the teleport. This will teleport you to exactly here on the map and you want to go south till you reach Fort Ferret. That's this spot on the map. Ignore all the enemies on the route to the fort no matter how big they are. And when you arrive at Fort Ferret you want to pick up a very nice talisman. You want to ignore all the bats while you're running inside and move towards the ladder. Just run, climb up and then pick up the Dactus medallion. This is very important so don't forget to do that. Then keep moving till you get to the second gap and jump down. Move to the right of yours, pick up the golden rune that's laying around there and then jump to the sneaky pathway to your right. Keep moving till you can jump down again and there will be the Radican Sword Shield. If you're not familiar with this talisman, it's a very good talisman that will help us out because it provides a lot of relevant stats right at the start of the game. Now the Radican Sword Shield is especially good for the Vagabond as every single point is relevant for us and it boosts both our damaging stats. After putting on the talisman, go outside and kill Grail with your flail. Spin the thing like there is no tomorrow. <laughs> to make it as easy and fast as possible to kill this dragon, the flail has built in bleed so you can just spin around and wait for those bleed procs to make quick work of the dragon. Make sure to pop the golden pickled fowl food before the dragon dies and also pop the golden rune that you picked up inside the fort. After all of that you'll be rich as fuck in runes and can get to level 36 at the very least. So you want to spend your runes something like this, actually exactly like this. You'll see why we invest a few points into Fate and Arcane in a strength and dexterity build in a second, but trust me it is worth it. You also want to spend quite some points into Vigor to really become tanky and the points into strength and dexterity are to meet the requirements of the weapon that we're going to use even if we decide to swap out the Radican Sword Shield at some point. Now after this, for the next 12 levels, just spend all your points into vigor to reach its first soft cap this is to really make us tanky early on and give us so much survivability it is going to be insane now don't worry about damage because you will see in a second that we will have a lot of damage one could almost say too much damage after that get from 48 to 60 get five points into mind and like seven points into endurance this gives us a lot more comfort in regards to attacking because we now have a bit more stamina and we also have a lot more mind so we can use our asher floor with a lot more comfort at that point in the game you also have a higher equip load so you can start thinking about upgrading your gear as well. Now after this point you will just want to put points in both strength and dexterity. 
but you will want to prioritize dexterity first because the weapon that we're going to use has slightly higher scaling with dexterity. To be precise, dexterity scales 1.463414634415 harder than strength for the weapon that we're going to use. And I know you wanted to know the exact number and that this is totally not a useless fact, so there you go. You'll also want to consistently put points into vigor and endurance all the way till you reach level 125 basically. Make sure to not go over the soft cap of Vigor though, but I will go in depth about the late game stats in the follow up video where we discuss the late game hybrid strength and dexterity build and character, but for now you have the guidelines to build your character and progress through the game. Now we want to do a few more things. First of all, go to the round table hall to do some shopping, talk to the creepy NPC that is lurking in the shadows and buy the finger seal. Then after that, talk to the intoxicated monk that will start saying random nonsense to you when you speak to him and buy everything. If you don't have the runes yet to do so, then ask yourself how did you become so poor so quickly and then afterwards buy the flame sling spell for now and buy the rest at the later time. Then after that, you want to go to Lurnia just bypass Stormville like this to get there and then go to this area near the rocky structure. There will be a scarab roaming in that area, kill it and you will get an awesome incantation that goes by the name of Blood Flame Blade. This is the main reason we spend points into Arcane and Fate and I will show you in a second why this incantation is so good. But first we want to pick up the trophy of the build. And there are these theories out there that say that the weapon that we're going to pick up is actually an end game weapon that was accidentally placed in Lingrave. Believe it or not, that's how good it is. And it's even crazier that the weapon is pretty much located near the starting area. Now you want to exactly go to this spot and enter the area. Now to get the weapon that we actually want to use, we have to defeat this guy. And for this fight, I would suggest to coat your flail with the Blood Flame Blade buff and just start smacking the shit out of the boss the second he spawns in for a quick kill. This is known as the brute force strategy and it works really well against this guy. If you otherwise struggle with him, make sure to use the flame sling from a range and you'll have an easier time like that finishing off. After killing this boss, you'll be rewarded with the Bloodhound Fang. Also known as Mr. Steal Your Girl, the endgame weapon that was accidentally put in Limgrave, the weapon that can do it all. And I'm not exaggerating because Bloodhound Fang is an absolute monster. It has the power and brutality of a strength weapon while having the speed and smoothness of a dexterity weapon. And as it scales through both strength and dexterity, it doesn't only feel as the ultimate strength and dexterity weapon, it is the ultimate strength and dexterity weapon. Especially if you consider that you can actually pick it up within 10 minutes of starting a new playthrough. Now Bloodhound Fang has a really nice moveset. It's fast, it has a good reach and it does a lot of damage. Don't blink while using the weapon or you will miss out on your own fights. It feels really satisfying to just erase the existence of your enemies with this sword. Now it also has the most OP status effect in the game on it, bleed, and after a few hits it will proc blood loss on your enemies and deal massive damage that way. In addition to the massive damage it already deals just through sheer force and physical brutality. The weapon also has a secret damage modifier that not a lot of people know about because if you jump and use a normal or charged attack, your attacks will deal plus 10% extra damage. Then we have the Ash of War as well, which is a beast in itself. It is a pretty wide AoE type of slash that obliterates your enemies and then with the momentum of the sword swing, you launch yourself backwards, creating distance between you and your enemies, which is a very nice addition because you prevent incoming attacks like that and it makes it really easy to hit your opponents while in melee range without getting hit yourself. This Ash of War has an additional component as well that many people do not know about and that's if you finish the initial attack, you can press the charged attack button to then teleport forwards and strike your opponents with another extremely hard hitting attack. So all in all, the Ash of War consists out of two parts that you can utilize very well in many different situations. And you also get iframes when you teleport, which is nice for dodging incoming attacks obviously. You can also for example hit an enemy with the first part of the Ash of War, kill it like that, then switch targets and kill another enemy with the second part of the Ash of War. It really makes up for a very cool and fun playstyle. 
Now if you thought that was all, no, there is even more to this weapon. Even though it's a unique weapon requiring somber smithing stones to upgrade with multiple scaling attributes and an unique azure 4 and thus normally these types of weapons wouldn't be able to be buffed with stuff like magic and incantations, the Bloodhound Fang simply doesn't care and actually defies the rules of the game because you can buff it with creases, enchant it with different types of magic and buff it with different types of incantations like the Blood Flame Blade and now you know the reason why we picked up the Blood Flame Blade incantation. Condition. Coating your Bloodhound Fang with Blood Flame Blade not only makes it look badass beyond belief, it also makes it even more dangerous. Your Bloodhound Fang will now also deal a good bit of fire damage in addition to its physical damage every time you strike your opponents. But even better, it applies a good amount of bleed over time on your enemies and this is a critical factor. What that really means is you will proc bleed on your enemies much faster and much more reliable and applying this buff on the Bloodhound Fang absolutely shreds. Now you have a really nice weapon and a really nice buff that you can completely destroy the game. But you can also upgrade the Bloodhound Fang to a nice level quite early on, even though in its most unupgraded form it's already really OP. So if you want to make it even more OP, make sure to go to EG in Lurnia on the road to Carrier Manor. He's next to the road to the manor craze, talk to him and you can buy Somber Smithing Stone 1 all the way to 4, buy them and then just upgrade your Bloodhound Fang at him at the same time as well. And now you'll have a plus 4 Bloodhound Fang. Then go back to Limgrave, go to the Dragonburn Runes and take the teleporter chest right there. You will teleport to the Sea Light Crystal Tunnel and you want to go outside of it. Go outside of the tunnel, mount up and basically keep moving forward while hugging the right side of this area. Till you get to exactly this opening, go to the right here and make your way to the end of the path where you will find the Somber Smithing Stone number 5. There is also a Somber Smithing Stone number 6 in the Celia Crystal Tunnel itself. You'll have to progress and move up and down various times. Ignore or kill off all the annoying ass enemies in this cave. Whatever you want to do, but just keep progressing till you get to the boss in this room exactly. Defeat the boss in the tunnel. Using Bloodhound Finesse, you should make quick work of this beast. And afterwards, you will have a Somber Smithing Stone number 6. And now you can upgrade your Bloodhound Fang all the way till plus 6. Now a few more things, because due to all the excitement I actually forgot to use the Flask of Wondrous Physic for this video. If you paid attention, you would see the Flask wasn't even picked up at any time, nor was it even in my inventory. But picking up the Flask of Wondrous Physic and then mixing it with both the Dexterity and Strength Not Crystal Tier will give you a whopping plus 20 in relevant stats from your flask as well. And this is one of the few builds where you can actually get that many points in relevant stats just from your flask. Doing that is very nice and will obviously make you even more OP than what you just saw. And you can get both of these crystal tiers at the very start of the game. Now if you want a more defensive flask then I would recommend picking up the Crimson Burst crystal tier in the Weeping Peninsula and the Opaline Heart tier in Kaelid which after patch 1.6 now also increases your physical damage negation. And that is also a very nice option for the flask. Whichever type of flask you want to run, you can't go wrong either way. But as you see, I didn't even pick up a flask myself and the build already slaps very hard. Now, since we have 12 Fate, we can also run a good selection of defensive incantations to help out with our defensive and tanky side. As I showed you earlier, you could already buy a good selection from the monk. Incantations like Magic Fortification and Flame Fortification to defend against magic and fire damage respectively can situationally be very nice. And you can also heal yourself as well because we have the requirements to run those types of incantations as well. Even though most of the time you will already have destroyed whatever you're fighting before ever needing to heal. But it's an option as well. Most importantly, you can also run incantations like Cure Poison and Flame Cleanse Me to cure yourself from things like Poison, Scarlet Rot, or even Frostbite in the case of Flame Cleanse Me, even though it's not specified in the description. If you want to know more about that trick, watch my 500 IQ Elden Ring tips and tricks video. But with those types of incantations in the roster as like an additional option, the Vagabond really has the tools to take on any situation and remove certain annoying status effects that certain enemies or certain areas apply on you very easy. Now, we're just missing one thing though before we end the video, something that would truly fit the Vagabond very well. For this, go ahead and kill Margaret first, it should be a quick fight with everything considered. After doing so, you will get another talisman pouch. After that, you can enter Stormville and do whatever you want there. 
but make sure before you start fighting Godric, the final boss in his place, to talk to Nefeli Lux, which will be in Stormville, and with some back and forth interacting with this NPC, you will ultimately get the Arsenal Charm. With the Arsenal Charm, your equip load will now become much higher, which is nice because we want to pick up a really nice shield to complement this build. Now for this you want to go back to the gate from Grace where you picked up your mount and then you want to start farming the guards with the Doritos shields specifically because every once in a while one of these guards will be kind enough to let you be able to loot their body after you murder them and give you the brass shield. Now the brass shield is an amazing shield in the early and mid game. It's basically the best shield all the way till you reach the capital. It has 100% physical guarded damage negation Meaning, when you block physical attacks like slash, pierce or strike attacks, you will not receive any damage. And at the same time, it has the highest guard boost out of all the medium shields in the game. Meaning, you will lose, relatively speaking, the least amount of stamina when you're blocking attacks with this shield compared to other shields. All of that, and it doesn't weigh too much for a shield, so we can actually use it very early on without entering heavy load territory. And the brass shield is really that good, it even compares with great shields, which are like twice the weight of the brass shield. And it's a shield you can get within two minutes of starting a new playthrough obviously make sure to put the shield in your offhand together with the seal so we can make use of either our shield or our seal and incantations at any time depending on the situation the vagabond has good starting gear it's actually the gear with the highest defensive stats out of all the starting classes so we'll address gear in the follow-up video when we actually need an upgrade now you'll have the best strength and dexterity weapon that you can get at the start of the game in combination with the best defensive tools like our brass shield making you combat ready for everything and everyone. Nothing can possibly stop you now. Warriors that are united by a cause and are deeply motivated to ensure their families can live on in a world ridden with conflict and evil are the most driven fighters. These fighters do not fight for glory, fame or riches. They were born into their role in life as a means for their clan to survive. They never really had a choice but to become a fighter. And only the dead have seen the end of war. So when everything is on the line, you have no choice but to become a very skilled fighter. The warrior has gotten a simple but effective nickname. Namely, the warrior. The warrior is the most skilled member of his clan. And according to the rumors, this individual has never lost a single battle in his life. The score? 221 to 0. Outside of his own tribe, this individual is also deeply connected with mysterious forces directly tied to the earth that have granted the skilled warrior access to very powerful and rare weapons sharpened by very specific ancient trees that only these forces have access to. Combine these powerful and lethal weapons with the dexterity, raw talent and skill of the fighter and you have a deadly mix. The warrior is the only starting class I have not covered yet in my get OP early guides. Well, I guess, but today is time for this class to shine and no, there is no particular reason that this class is the last one on the list, it's just how the stars align. I actually really like this class in terms of aesthetics and lore. It has one of the coolest grips out of all starting classes, so that is a nice mental boost that you get when you choose the warrior. The warrior starts with very high levels in dexterity, making it the class with the highest starting levels in dexterity. Choose the warrior, pick the golden seed for the best starting keepsake and let's start wrecking things. In game you'll see that you'll start off with two scimitars and a shield, giving you an impression of the direction that we're going with this build. High dexterity, razor sharp, hard cutting, agile weapons and really destruction everywhere. We will build our warrior as a pure dexterity skilled fighter that just completely slices through everything like it's butter, destroying enemies instantly. Thankfully the most brutal and hardest hitting weapon when doing a pure dexterity build can be gotten right at the start of the game. And not only one of them, no, you can get two of these rare weapons, or even more if you're feeling funky. But this step will be a bit easier if you give yourself a head start so you don't die as quickly. So let's get OP early first. If the next step for you is familiar, then you can skip to the timestamp shown on screen. If not, buckle up and let's get going. First of all, go to the gate front side of Grace, get your mount from Melina. After getting the mount, we can now finally move around with some pace. Then go to the second caravan down the road from where you just spoke Melina. 
in the scarfen there will be a chest at the back side loot it and you will get the flail then go back to the starting area right where you just met your bff and mount and ride to the beach in the southern part of this place it is really close to the starting area on the beach you will find a golden pickled fowl food which you will want to use in a second and it's now time to go to Kaelid. go to the third church of america pick up the goodies that are laying around here for you to pick up and then go beyond the church and take the teleport this will teleport you to exactly here on the map and you want to go south till you reach Fort Ferret. That's this spot on the map. Ignore all the enemies on the route to the fort no matter how big they are. And when you arrive at Fort Ferret you want to pick up a very nice talisman. You want to ignore all the bats while you're running inside and move towards the ladder. Just run, climb up and then pick up the Dactus medallion. This is very important so don't forget to do that. Then keep moving till you get to the second gap and jump down. Move to the right of yours pick up the golden rune that's laying around there and then jump to the sneaky pathway to your right keep moving till you can jump down again and there will be the radican sword shield if you're not familiar with this talisman it's a very good talisman that will help us out because it provides a lot of relevant stats right at the start of the game after putting on the talisman go outside and kill grail with your flail spin the thing like there is no tomorrow <laughs> To make it as easy and fast as possible to kill this dragon the flail has built-in bleed so you can just spin around and wait for those bleed procs to make quick work of the dragon make sure to pop the golden pickled fowl food before the dragon dies and also pop the golden rune that you picked up inside the fort after all of that you'll be rich as f in runes and can get to level 36 at the very least with your new collection of runes you want to level up something like this in combination with the Radican Sword Shield, this will make sure we meet the requirements to wield the weapons that we're going to use. And it also gives you a good amount of sustain and tankiness with our investment in Endurance and Vigor. And since our weapons scale insanely hard with Dexterity, we also put a few extra points in Dexterity to make us even hit harder. The Guardians of the Earth Tree possess a powerful weapon, the Guardian Sword Spear. This is a special weapon type. It is the only weapon of the Sword Spear type in the game. And no, that's not an actual type. It is actually classified as a Halberd. But nonetheless, it has something unique for sure. Even if you just look at how this thing looks. What's even more unique about this weapon is that it scales insanely hard with Dexterity. It is the hardest scaling Dexterity weapon in the entire game. With the potential to reach ridiculous numbers of AR. And like like I said, you can get it right away. It beats every other weapon in the game that scales really well with dexterity as well. And as you see, the difference can be up to several hundreds of AR. This weapon is really nuts. And when we get to the combat in a bit, you'll see exactly what I mean. The best farm I have found for this particular weapon is in, take your guesses, 3, 2, 1, the best region in the game, Gaelid, right near the minor air tree in the western part. There are like 8 guardians here in close proximity, and they are not high level, unlike some of the guardians found in other regions or other places. Making them the perfect farm to get two guardian sword spears when you're just starting out a new playthrough the warriors double scimitar makes it a very easy farm as well you can just jump attack to quickly deal with them without you running a lot of risk of dying you want to keep doing this over and over reload the area until you have two guardian sword spears two is more than one everyone knows that so that makes it better right but on a serious note, you will see why running 2 is really nice in a bit. Reload the area at the church for the best reload point. If you don't want to deal with the invader, either make her jump off the nearby cliff so you get rid of her the old fashioned way or just normally defeat her or just run away towards the guardians because you don't have to fight her at all actually. Whatever works best for you. If RNG is not on your side, you can pick up a silver pickled fowl food to increase your luck. But otherwise, it is not too bad if the farm takes a bit longer since it gives you a lot of runes as well, which is nice for a later part in this video when we want to upgrade our sword spears. When you get two of these babies, it is time to completely destroy the game. I really wasn't exaggerating before when I was saying that these things are so insanely lethal, it is not even funny. But wait, didn't the warrior and his tribe and the guardians form an alliance, so why are you killing them? Well, the guardians of the earth tree are a bit of a weird species. Nobody truly understands them. What's up? What's up? But what we do know is that they are very proficient in combat and take massive pride in their weapons. They're not going to give their rare weapons for free to you. What are you, charity? No, you need to prove yourself and kill them over and over till they deem you worthy to get their weapons. They don't care that they die, they magically get back to life when you decide to rest at a nearby church anyways, it is all good. 
I really wasn't exaggerating before when I was saying that these things are so insanely lethal it is not even funny. With both the Power Stance moveset, the normal moveset of the Sword Spear in your main hand, as well as the jump attacks you get when wielding two of these, you are completely covered in every access of combat. Nothing will slip by your side basically. Now I do recommend you to use R1 or just the normal attacks with your main hand Sword Spear for when you just want to quickly kill things that are in your way, as it has the quick moveset of just running one Guardian Sword Spear. And then use the Power Stance moveset when you feel like there's more leeway, because Hitting your enemies with two of these will obviously hit harder, but they will also take a bit longer to swing. The Sword Spears have a really nice range to them, making jump attacks in particular really effective, and that is the main reason we're running two of them. Jump attacks with these things are insanely powerful, and they hit like an absolute truck with the setup that I will show you in a second. Jump attacks also give you a really reliable way to kill enemies that are way higher level than you, even if you just started out a new playthrough. So you definitely want to utilize them whenever you see fit. What is also nice is that all of these different types of ways of attacking your enemies will in fact stagger them with these weapons. So you always feel like you will completely control any situation in combat. So let's also go over the Ashes of Wars that you want to run with this pure dexterity build. And these Ashes of Wars will make these weapons absolute beasts. The first one that is amazing on a Guardian Sword Spear is going to be Sword Dance in fact. And this Ash 4 can be gotten in Southwest Lernia, quite close to Limbrave actually, as a drop from a Teardrop Scarab, right next to the Minor Earth Tree. You'll want to put this one on your main Ash 4. Now, Sword Dance consists out of 3 hits basically. Make sure to cast the Ash of War again, or any input really, after the first 2 slashes finish to end with a third downward slash that deals really crazy damage. Applying the Ash of War on your weapon also makes it a keen weapon, which is exactly what we want, as it will make our weapon scale even harder with dexterity, resulting in insane damage. Now, using Sword of Dance with Guardian Sword Spear and my setup will just trivialize a lot of bosses, literally. Many bosses will be gone within seconds. The good thing about this Ash of War is that it also gives you really decent hyper armor when you cast it, which means you won't get interrupted every time you cast it, and you usually will be able to get that 3 part combo in and get all of that juicy damage on your enemies. For our offhand Guardian Sword Spear, we want to use something that can deal with things in the distance, since as you just saw, we are definitely covered in every aspect in melee range. That way we will cover every aspect of combat, and there are two great options for this. Now if you just care about doing damage, then Ice Spear is going to be the best choice for your offhand Sword Spear. No contest, Ice Spear is not just an incredible Ash of War for this build specifically, it is one of the best Ashes of Wars in the game in general, and you can pick it up right at the start of the game. It will deal great damage with barely any investment in stats, procs Frostbite Burst on your enemies and applies the Frostbite debuff, which results in a boost to your damage damage output on your target. Ice Spear however is already a part of my Bandit Get OP early video however, and I really want every class to have a different moveset and feel, at least in my universe. The one thing that holds Ice Spear from not just being absolutely broken beyond repair is its range. What if we give ourselves the ability to strike enemies anywhere, anytime? There's another Ash of War that has unlimited range. Yes, you heard it right, you can hit things that are literally across the map with this Ash of War. This is Spectral Lands, and this is going to be the Ash of War that I'm going to put on my offhand Sword Spear. So for you, you can decide whatever Ash of War you want. Either option is going to be really good. But Spectral Lands is not amazing due to its damage. No, it is rather amazing because of its range and poise damage. It literally stance breaks everything you're fighting really fast and you can do this again from any distance. You can outrange enemies with this Ash of War that should technically outrange you. With Spectral Lands you get the opportunity to strike anything, anywhere, everywhere. This feeling of just having a tool to always strike whatever is really nice, and with all the control you get with Spectral Lands in combat, it is a really good Ash of War in my opinion, and you can get it right at the start of the game. The Ash of War also got a buff recently, making it now the best time to try out this Ash of War. To get it, you want to grab the key that unlocks Ryer Lucaria Academy right here, go inside the Academy, move past everything or just kill everything if you want, but make sure you get to the Church of the Cuckoo Grace and go outside in the graveyard. When you're in the graveyard, you want to move all the way up till you can go down again essentially and you'll find a Teardrop Scarab there that drops the Ash of War for you. 
It comes with a cold on default, but after you defeat Margit, you can obtain the Iron Red Blade, which gives you the opportunity to make your other Sword Spirit keen as well, which is what you definitely want to have ultimately. You can kill Margit in like 10 seconds, and you definitely want to have both of your weapons on the keen affinity since it will make your raw damage as high as possible. Speaking about killing Margit, after killing Margit you can pick up your second talisman. The Claw Talisman in Stormville, not too far away from where you just killed Margit, is a really nice second talisman to make you even more OP early on. This talisman will make your jump attacks hit even harder. But before killing Margit and picking up the loot in Stormville, I would recommend you to do a few more things to have the ultimate start. Now we have two sword spears with the ashes of wars that we want, but it's time to upgrade them. To get both of them to plus 6, make sure to go to the Raya Lucaria crystal tunnel, go to the bottom of this cave to fight the Chrysalian right there. If you're doing this, then you will see that the first few hits won't do much at all. Don't panic, after you break this Crystallian's armor, you will start absolutely destroying him. And from that point onwards, this fight becomes an absolute joke. You will destroy this guy completely, especially if you use jump attacks, because they will deal great damage and stagger this boss over and over. Killing this boss gives you the bell bearing that you need to get both of your weapons to plus 6. And from the farm earlier shown in this video, when we were fishing for those sword spears, you should have some runes by now, so you can actually start right away upgrading your sword spears. To get your weapons to even higher levels, make sure to go to Fort Hate and get the other side of the Detectus Medallion right there, so you can go to the Altus Plateau region. After you get into Lernia, you want to move towards the bridge, something like this. When you arrive at the bridge, you can open it with your Detectus Medallion, and in the Altus Plateau region, you want to go to the Seal Tunnel and pick up the Smithing Stone Miner spell being number two. In the seal tunnel, hit the hidden wall, go to the chest and pick up the second bell bearing to give you the possibility to buy a smithing stone 3 and 4. Then you want to start farming the miners here. When you have farmed enough smithing stone number 5s, move through the cave some more while hitting more of the hidden walls here. And eventually you will want to drop down to the room with the big abductor thing. Go to the, I don't know what it is, but it has light reading from its structure. Lure the abductor to it. And when he moves towards you and hits the structure, he will break it open. And it will make it possible for you to loot three more smithing stones. This time it's a smithing stone number six. With all those smithing stones, you'll be able to get your main hand sword spear to plus 16. And your offhand sword spear to plus 15. And you'll have the best possible start on already really hard scaling weapons. But feel free to adjust the level you upgrade your sword spears to, what feels the best for you and how much you want to farm. You also definitely want to pick up some good crystal tiers for your flask of wonders physic. The first one is a no brainer, get the dexterity not crystal tier in Lyurnia. It raises our dexterity with 10 extra levels for free essentially and do I really need to say more? The second crystal tier is going to be the Fate Nold crystal tier that you can pick up in the Weeping Peninsula right here. It allows us to use certain incantations without needing to spend levels on Fate, which is really nice. And that brings me to the next step. It fits the overall team to electrify our main hand sword spear. Not only does it make the sword spear look amazing, it applies the effect also on your enemies, which looks really cool as well. You can't deny it. But outside of aesthetics, functionally speaking, it also does something obviously. It raises your damage output and it's a nice welcome bonus. The effect will stay on your weapon for 90 seconds and trust me that is more than enough for anything when you just kill things in mere seconds. To get the incantation, we have to go back to Lyurnia, go near the artist Shag Grace and kill the knight that patrols there. It should be a really easy fight with your upgraded stuff and this knight will drop a book for you. Turn in the book wherever you want. If you want the easiest route, just do it at the monk at the round table hold. Buy the electrifier ornament incantation and you can also buy other incantations if you want. Because with our fate not crystal tier, we can use a lot of incantations now as well. With this thing applied on our main hand sword spear, everything will just die instantly as you see. And now you actually do it in fashion as well. If you want to increase the damage output that you get with this incantation, make sure to upgrade your shield that you're casting the incantation with because it skills with it. Thankfully, we just picked up two smithing stone minor bell bearings so we can get this thing all the way to plus 12. Easy peasy right away. Gear. Like I said at the start of the video, you start out with a really cool armor set as the warrior and it definitely suffices for now. Mainly thanks to our staggering capabilities with our weapons, good amount of points in vigor and sword dance having a good chunk of hyper armor. Most importantly the set fits the mystic aesthetic and theme of this build and weapons really well actually. You will also probably get the entire guardian set while farming for guardian sword spears as these different armor pieces have a higher drop rate than the actual weapons and that is a 
really nice bonus because this is a really cool looking set that obviously fits the weapons very well as well. So you do have two options in terms of the armor you want to run with this build. For stats, you want to just keep investing points mainly in dexterity and vigor while you progress as these are our two most important stats for a pure dexterity build. Also make sure to spend some points in endurance to get better gear later on and give us a bigger stamina pool and then I would also recommend you to spend just a few points in mind so we can always comfortably use our ashes of wars. The numbers on screen are a good guideline and what you should aim for in my opinion. Now you'll have an incredibly powerful warrior build that you will just destroy every boss with. You can finish the entire game with this build easily, you'll look badass and dual wielding guardian sword spears with our ashes of wars and all the utility in our kit is just too good. This is truly the definition of a powerful pure dexterity build and if you want you can just speed run the game, as you see the fights are really quickly over. The hero, or the big muscular warrior that always seems to save the day just in time with pure strength, brutality and sustain is a force to be reckoned with. Wielding big weapons, and with big I mean big. The biggest and most hard hitting weapon in the game essentially, while being insanely tanky and dealing massive damage is the way of the pure strength build. The hero is not concerned with summons or buffs or other types of gimmicks meant for peasants. Time is money and we don't have time to do anything but to smash everything in our pet completely into the ground. And today I will show you the most powerful and OP pure strength build that is incredibly fun to use and more importantly that you can make at the very start of the game, as always. So for the pure strength or beefy warrior that just smashes everything in its path to a pulp, you will want to go with the hero class. It has probably some of the best starting stats in the game, high strength, high vigor and high endurance, so exactly what we need. For your keepsake it does not matter what you take, but as always the golden seed is good just for the free extra flask at the start of the game. When you load into the game you'll see that you get a shield and an axe, you can immediately throw them in the bin. The axe is just too small, look at this thing, we can't use that stuff. And nobody got time to use a shield when we can just destroy everything and incoming damage will only scratch us at the most. So what you want to do right off the bat is go to our favorite location in the game, Kaelid. Kaelid seems to always have the answers for everything and anything, so for this build we will have to go there as well. First off make sure to go to the gate front runes to talk to Melina to get your mount, then afterwards you want to go to this spot to pick up the golden pickled fowl food and after you've done that you want to go to this spot exactly. When you arrive at this spot exactly you'll find a carriage with a chest inside of it that you can loot and you will get the Morningstar weapon. Now that you have the Morningstar weapon go to the Dragon Burnt runes, here you want to take the teleporter chest, it will teleport you to Kaelid, surprise surprise nobody knew that at this point in time. It will specifically teleport you to the Celia Crystal Tunnel and when you get here just run outside ignore every enemy and when you get outside you want to move through Kaelid something like this, you want to unlock the map like this basically because later in this video there is a bunch of stuff that we need to pick up in Kaelid and they will be close to the sites of graces that you see on the map right now. When you finish following this path you will end up at Fort Ferret and here you want to pick up the Radican Sword Shield. So when you get to the fort, go inside of it, run to the ladder, ignore every single enemy that you see here and when you get to the ladder, climb up, loot the chest and pick up the medallion piece. This is very important for later so don't forget about it and then just move as shown till you can jump down the gap. After that you'll want to take a right turn and keep running till you can jump on the pretty sneaky pathway right here. Then you move forwards and you will finally be able to jump down and pick up the Radican Sword Shield. This is a gold tier talisman that is also going to be very good for a pure strength build because it gives us plus 5 in stats for all the relevant stats and gives us plus 5 in dexterity to meet the requirements of the weapon that we're going to use. So it is a no brainer pickup and you want to get it. Now go outside, kill Grayol, the big dragon with your morning star, which procs bleed and when he's close to dying make sure to pop the gold pickled fowl food for the plus 30% increase in runes, then get all those juicy runes and now we have opened the build. You'll want to invest the points of the runes as following, get 27 endurance, get about 25 vigor and then put the rest into strength. We will get all the strength damage we need and more from our weapon upgrades, affinities, pickups and the way we actually use our weapon shown later in this video so we don't really need to put many points in it for now and instead prioritize endurance so our stamina doesn't run out so quickly when using big weapons and you want to compensate for that as much as possible and it makes it possible to actually get the tanky gear that we are going to get later on which is very important as well. 
and then the vigor is just to make sure that you are beefy at the start and can sustain hits. Now that we have the template of our build done, it's time to pick up our weapon. For this you want to go to the Kalem Rune site of grace and when you arrive there you will see a caravan right next to you. Go to it, ignore the enemies if you want and just make sure to loot that chest in there. Because inside of the chest will be the greatsword and this thing is an absolute monster. And with the changes to colossal weapons in the game it became even better after patch 1.04. Even in its most standard and unoptimized form with no upgrades whatsoever this thing will do a lot of damage to everything in your path. In addition to normal damage it has insane poise damage as well and its range is crazy because yeah look at the size of this thing. And after the recent patch it attacks faster. It covers faster and when you two hand it it will deal more damage as well compared to before which is really nice because we want to two hand it at this part in the game for sure when doing so we get a 1.5 multiplier to our strength and thus we meet the requirements to actually wear it it makes the points that we invested in our stats very efficient and more importantly all our attacks will now deal more damage as well and it just looks badass two handing a sword you can't deny it and you can already start using it in its current form you will just brute force yourself through everything and kill all the enemies in your path but really, this is just the start of the build. And you might also think Greatsword, that's a really generic, boring and bland name for a sword that's supposedly so OP. This guy is just trying to scam. Well... For all the weeps out there, this is your weapon. And if you're not a weep, well, it's still a very epic sword, okay? The Greatsword, or Guts Greatsword, should I rather say, is really great because it out damages its competition. And many of the other colossal swords in the game are pickups that you can only get much later on in the game. While well, you can actually get the Greatsword at the very start of the game. And yes, movesets are a thing, but I find the Greatsword's moveset also one of the best in that regard as well, for sure. You will also see that there are a bunch of colossal swords with fixed Ashes of Wars, meaning you can change it. And some of those Ashes of Wars are quite lackluster but thankfully you can also change the great swords ash of war and that's something we're definitely going to do because there is something very op out there but before we get into that let's first upgrade our great sword you want to go to fort height for this and get the left part of the medallion right here now if you watch my samurai build you know that i thought of a way to get a weapon that needs smithing stones for upgrades to plus 15 by only going to two locations and that's what you want to do here as well because it is the least tedious way to upgrade your sword first of all go to lernia here is a drawn out pad to get there if you don't know how to get there from Limgrave. Then go to the Uriah Crystal Tunnel right here. Go to the bottom of this cave, just ignore everyone. And then finally when you get to the bottom you will see the Crystallian boss. Now usually this boss is very annoying, but in this case he's a complete joke as our great sword makes quick work of him and destroys his crystallized armor really fast. So when you destroy him you will get the bell bearing for buying smithing stone 1 and 2. So that's nice. After that you want to go to the seal tunnel in the Altus Plateau region. Which thanks to picking up both parts of the medallion you can now access very easily at the very start of the game. In the seal tunnel move like this to get to the chest. In the chest you will find the second bell bearing you need to buy smithing stone 3 and 4. Then start farming the guys here because they drop smithing stone number 5. Do that until you have 12 smithing stone number 5. And by farming these guys you will also get all the runes you need to buy all the smithing stones and actually upgrade your sword at the smith. I highly recommend you to upgrade your swords for every few thousands of runes that you get as the difference in clearing speed is going to be much faster with say a plus 1 great sword compared to a plus 6 great sword or a plus 6 great sword to a plus 11 great sword and so forth and so forth. If you want to farm less you can also get 8 smithing stone number 5s in the Cilia crystal tunnel that we teleported to earlier in this video to get to Kaelid. Doing that will only make you need 4 more smithing stone number 5s from the miners so it's definitely a big cut on the number of enemies you have to farm. Now that you have upgraded your weapon it's time to pick up the Ash of War that you'll want to use. For this you want to go to Fort Gale in yet again Kaelid. When I said this region has all the good stuff I wasn't lying. But easiest way to approach this fort is from the north then when you get there go up the stairs past the gate ignore the annoying guy shooting his purple just on you just move forward till you get to the ladder. When you climb up you will see Simba after he went down the dark path and became addicted to Crystal Mad. This guy is our next target. He's very hyperactive and is quite tanky but our upgraded greatsword will make quick work of him thankfully. And after that you are blessed with the Lion's Claw Ash of War. This thing is the definition of OP. It smashes your opponent completely into the ground. Face first, humiliates them and gives you enough time to take a big dump on them. It has insane damage, but it has insane poise damage as well. And if you don't know how poise works or what it actually means, then check out the video I made about poise. It's only 8 minutes and you will know everything you need to know. And why poise damage is so great and thus why this Ash of War is crazy good as well. 
Add to that that it has insane hyper armor when you use it, meaning that if even 8 million enemies would attack you at the same time, you will still get it off and won't get interrupted and get all that damage in. And the fact that we actually have enough sustain, we can just tank everything that comes our way when using this ability. Finally, it got a major buff after patch 1.04. It has now increased casting speed and decreased recovery time, which means you can just spam this absolute monster and get all that damage in quickly, reliably, and make every enemy break their stance really quickly as well. You want to pick up this thing as soon as possible. Now after doing that, you want to go and kill Margit. You will just completely destroy him with Lion's Claw within second. And as you can see, stance break him as well very easily and very quickly. You want to do this right now because it gives us a second talisman slot. As you can see, we are pretty much naked at this point in time with the hero's armor set. And yeah, having a six pack is cool and fun and all and yeah, 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 but it won't help out against sharp objects. Now we want to pick up the gear with the absolute best defensive stats and poise that you can get at the very start of the game. This is going to be the badass banished knight set. Yet again we want to go to Caleb for this right near the cathedral of dragon communion. There are going to be two knights here that you can farm and get the entire set by just farming them. So start stomping these guys and get the set. It's going to be really fun for you just seeing how powerful the sword is right now. Before you equip the entire set you'll also want to use our second talisman slot to equip the great jars arsenal talisman. Otherwise you will be forced into heavy load territory as it is a heavy armor set which we don't want of course we want those nice medium rolls the great jars arsenal talisman is actually a late game talisman but you can get it at the very start of the game in the northern part of caleb from the big ass jar after defeating three invaders now if this is completely new for you and you don't know how to get here or what to do to win versus the three late game invaders i got you covered because i went into great detail in my fate build video in how to do all of that so i will put a timestamped link in the description for those that did not watch my fate build i just want to add one thing if the enemy gets stuck at the wall and moving around doesn't really help try jumping as well because it does work as the good old bait now that we have our desired gear set and our talismans done your defensive stats will be extremely high as you can see compared to before while still being in the medium load category and you will have enough points to get past the poise break point to start resisting stance breaking hits so that's very nice as well for the flask you definitely want to pick up the strength crystal tier in limgrave this is going to give us plus 15 in strength with our two-handed multiplier for three whole minutes and with only spending two points into strength this will mean that we're going to be effectively level 50 in strength just with our setup right at the start of the game and then don't forget we also have upgraded our great sword all the way to plus 15 so it's going to deal massive damage then you want to pick up the green burst crystal tier which will be really nice for stamina recovery and as you know swinging with big swords takes quite some stamina so that's definitely a very nice pickup to really help out with that for stats you want to get some more mine to be able to use lion's claw comfortably without running out of fp so quickly doing so will make the whole experience a lot smoother so i would suggest to put a prior on that right away and get at least 20 Strength, you want to soft cap yourself at 54 for the two handed setup and then get 40 vigor at least as well so you'll just be able to tank everything. I will cover the late game build in the follow up video as always but for now this build is going to completely destroy everything for you in your path until you reach that point and probably will just also destroy everything in the late game as well to be honest but you know me I like optimization so I will be making a follow up video. Now with this build you will be insanely powerful, your damage output is going to be insane and it's just a lot of fun to play. Whether you use your regular hits, your charged hits or your ash of war, everything you do is going to deal a lot of damage. Then both your weapons attacks as well as your lion's claw have insane poise damage, so it can easily stance break any enemy that challenges you and make quick work of them. Add to that that lion's claw has a really fast gas speed and hyper armor so you can just spam it for reliable and quick damage. And finally you're insanely tanky and have great armor so you have a lot of sustain and survivability while you destroy everything in your path. Using bleed and elbowing is nice and it destroys your enemies rather quickly. But what happens if you add another OP status effect to the mix known by the name of frostbite? And to make it even better, what if you also add fire to the mix and thus can infinitely keep proccing your frostbites next to your bleed procs on your enemies?
the cold blooded flame is exactly specialized in that. Namely, the arts of mixing fire, bleed, and frostbite together to quickly erase the existence of whatever he's fighting on the battlefield. In addition to this, the cold blooded flame has a very diverse moveset and various tools to completely break his opponents, whether they are nearby or in the distance. His fighting style is characterized with elegance, harmony, and ninja esque dance, and with this, is a real force to be reckoned with. This is my get OP early guide for the bandit. The bandit fits the idea of either a bleed or a bleed frost build very well because the class has in fact the highest number of points in arcane and dexterity for its starting levels. Exactly the two stats that will be our main stats. Arcane is intrinsically linked to bleed procs because it influences the pace of blood loss buildup on enemies and it also scales the raw damage of our weapons. And regarding dexterity, well the weapons in this build that we will use will primarily scale their raw damage through dexterity. And dexterity is also a very important stat for weapons that have the cold affinity. This makes the bandit a great choice for this build as a starting class. Now the bandit starts with a few things, really capitalizing on being lightweight and using small equipment and setting up for an assassin or stealth type of playstyle. You get a dagger, a small shield and a short bow, nothing really too crazy. In this build we are going to take it to the next level however and use equipment that is a lot more powerful and fits the starting stat distribution of the bandit. The bandit that we will build and ultimately make evolve into the cold blooded flame is going to be an elegant killer using very deadly swords that have blades on both sides of the hilt. However, if you're interested in a build that revolves around daggers, then check out my Black Flame Rogue build. In that video, I go over what is actually the most powerful assassin type of build for when you want to use daggers. That build is also very fun. It is a fate based build and in my opinion, much stronger than a dagger build that focuses on bleed or other status effects. And since it's a fate build, it doesn't really fit the band. However, like I said, we're going to make something extremely powerful and fun for the bandit as well that actually fits his starting stat distribution the best. And funny enough, there's already a great weapon right next to the starting area. For it, you want to go to the Dragon Burnt Runes and approach it from the south basically. In the south, you will find a set of stairs that leads downstairs into a room with a chest. Now, it is important that you open the right chest because if you open the wrong chest in this place, you will be teleported to a place that will give you PTSD. So make sure it's this one. Inside of this chest will be the twin blade. The twin blade is the easiest to get twin blade within the weapon class of twin blades but it's definitely up to par with the other twin blades. We're going to use twin blades for this build because they are the best way to set up an infinite bleed frost proc build and they just deal a lot of damage in general. In addition to that, Twin Blades have a really nice moveset. Even though they are on the heavier side, they feel very fluent and smooth to use. You can hit your enemies with both sides of the sword. So either blade works and both the normal attack moveset as well as the charged attacks feel nice to use. Thanks to the rather large range of these weapons, it's also a very reliable way to hit your opponents. And with their movesets in mind, they will deal a lot of damage just in mere seconds. So you can just keep hitting things with your blades quickly. But that's not all, because if you use two twin blades at the same time, it becomes even better and you become double the trouble. We will also be using jump attacks with them. With this, you can quickly build up frost and bleed on your enemies because you can hit your enemies up to six times with just a single jump attack. And I will be talking about that more in depth later on in this video. But now, with that in mind, this is the first twin blade we can start using to set up the build and just already start killing everything. The twin blade actually comes already with a pretty nice Ash of War. It is pretty basic, but it's an elegant move and definitely does a great job early game of dealing a lot of damage to enemies quickly. We will still replace it though in a bit, but yeah. Before we set up the actual build though, we want to do the basics to get OP early. 
If you know, then you know exactly what I'm talking about, but I will quickly go over it so the new players that watch this video also know what I'm talking about. First of all, you want to get the golden pickled fowl food right here in Limgrave. But when you have done so, go to the third church of America, pick up the goodies that are laying around here for you to pick up, and then go beyond the church and take the teleport. This will teleport you to exactly here on the map, and you want to go south till you reach Fort Ferret. That's this spot on the map. Ignore all the enemies on the route to the fort, no matter how big they are. And when you arrive at Fort Ferret, you want to pick up a very nice talisman. You want to ignore all the bats while you're running inside and move towards the ladder. Just run, climb up and then pick up the Dactus Medallion. This is very important, so don't forget to do that. Then keep moving till you get to the second gap and jump down. Move to the right of yours, pick up the golden rune that's laying around there and then jump to the sneaky pathway to your right. Keep moving till you can jump down again and there will be the Radican Source Heal. If you're not familiar with this talisman, it's a very good talisman that will help us out because it provides a lot of relevant stats right at the start of the game. Then go outside. Kill Grail, the big ass dragon. When you get to Grail, you can just use the great knife that the bandit starts with. It already has bleed on it, so you can just keep slashing the dragon with the dagger to proc bleed over and over till he dies. Make sure to use the golden pickled fowl food right before he dies and you will get a whopping number of runes. And also make sure to use the golden rune you picked up inside the fort. With this you will have a bunch of runes and if you go to level up with them you can go from level 5 to level 36 and get quite some levels in stats that we definitely want. First of all you want to get 22 dexterity and at least 19 arcane. With this you will have all the requirements for the equipment we will use without the need to always have the Redican Source Shield and it already gives a nice boost to our damage output and blood loss buildup. And then put all the rest of the points into vigor making you already very tanky and have a lot of sustain early on. Which is nice because we will be in melee territory a lot with this build. And thus you can actually take a lot of hits yourself without dying so quickly now. Now that you have done that you have a nice start. And you want to get the second weapon for this build. First of all you want to go to Fort High to get the second part of the medallion. The other half basically. And with both sides of the medallion it is time to make the journey to the Altus Plateau region. Go back to Limgrave, go to Lurnia and bypass Stormville. You don't need to defeat any bosses to go to the Altus Plateau region. Then move towards the lift in the northeastern part of Lurnia. Use the medallion at the lift and you'll have access to the Altus Plateau region. In the Altus Plateau region you want to go to the second church of America. And in this place you will find an extremely dangerous and fearsome person that is so powerful that you will need at least 9 million hours of playtime in Elder Ring to defeat her not even your could defeat her and as you see he's lying on the ground and got completely humiliated by the person we're going to face in a second look who's here this bitch just has it all she can use dragon attacks moves that proc bleed on you and she deals a lot of damage while moving around quickly this is the definition of unbalanced how do we defeat such a monster early on i i don't know do we just call it quits here and give up no, because Eleonora might look powerful, but she has the IQ of a pavement tile. Just jump off the ledge right near the church and this dumbass will just jump right with you and kill herself as well. That is what we call convenience. Now you will die as well, but you respawn at least and she doesn't, so you get the juicy loot we came for. Also to be honest, if you want to actually defeat her normally early on in the game, or actually at the very start of the game, like in this video. She isn't that hard to beat, just keep attention on her moves and when she goes to cast a dragon attack, that's your moment to just strike because you can smack her into the ground every time like that. But otherwise you can just use the good old bait to make quick work of her. Whatever option you choose to get rid of her will net you Eleanor's pull blade at the very start of the game. And this is the perfect weapon for this build because Eleanor's pull blade has innate bleed. And with that is the only twin blade in the game that actually has innate bleed, which makes it perfect for the early and mid game. You don't need any upgrades to get a significant amount of bleed, nor do you have to get a wet blade or ash of war to apply the blood affinity on your weapon to get blood loss build up in the first place. But that's not all because Eleanor's pull blade is extremely versatile. So not only does it have the most OP status effect in the game already on it, it also has all the benefits that I mentioned with the normal twin blade, so great moveset, damage, range, 
flexibility and it's just a very smooth weapon to use. But in addition, it also has Blood Blade Dance, which is the Ash of War that is unique to this weapon. The Ash of War just breaks whatever you're fighting, to be honest. It has a lot of poise damage inside of it, so you can use it to stance break things quickly to set up for critical hits or to set up for easy jump attacks. In addition to the Ash of War just being a nice way to quickly hit your enemies in succession, it gets a lot of damage in, it builds up blood loss to proc bleed as well, and it's just extremely versatile in the things you can do with it. If you press anything at the end of the dance, so after getting all the damage in, you can do this evasive maneuver as well, so you can ninja yourself out, take a step back so you don't get hit, and make sure whatever you're fighting isn't going to retaliate against you. And did you think that was all? No, because Elinor's pull blade is also half fire damage, so if you use this twin blade in conjunction with another twin blade with frost, which is exactly how we're going to build our other twin blade, it will remove the frostbite application on your enemy. And I'll go a bit more in depth about this in a second. All in all, the weapon is just extremely versatile and you can use it for whatever purpose you want really. You don't have to just use it for the jump attacks to keep proccing bleed and frost. You can also just use it to stance break your enemies and go for easy critical hits like I said. Or just use the Ash of War to deal damage quickly or use the actual moveset of the Twin Blade to deal damage like that. There is a lot you can do. Now if you have made it to this point in the video then that can only mean one thing, you like the video. So make sure to hit that like button and if you're not subscribed to me then make sure to hit that subscribe button as well. Because it is free and yeah, why wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> now that we have this beauty in our possession it is time to modify our other twin blade accordingly so we really become a cold blooded serial killer. For this we want to go to the southern part of Lurnia, pretty much near the gate down bridge grace. Make sure that it's night though when you do this or the guy we want to murder won't show up. Because when it's night there will be a night cavalry patrolling the area and this is our next target on the hit list because this guy will give you something very powerful as well. With Eleonora's pull blade he should be quick work and the best feeling is when you knock him off the horse and then pierce him because without his horse this guy is nothing and it just feels too good. And when you kill him he will drop the ice spear ash of war. This Ash of War is incredible and it fits this build so well because it now makes our build the best version of a frost bleed build possible, especially one that you can make at the start of the game. Put this Ash of War on your normal twin blade and it will now become a cold twin blade. This means your twin blade can apply frost on your enemies and thus proc frostbite at the very start of the game. Since this Ash of War applies cold on your sword, you don't need to go the traditional route of obtaining the wet blade to manually apply cold on your sword. And you can get that wet blade only after you defeat the dog with rabies in the Raya Lucaria Academy anyway, so you'd have to do story stuff. In other words, this is exactly what we need and want to complete the build so early on. But that's not all, because really we had pretty much everything we want in our build already if you just strictly talk about wanting to destroy everything in the game, if you think about it, except for one thing, something to attack enemies with in the distance. And this is exactly what Ice Spear does. Not only that, but it looks and feels amazing as well to use, and definitely fits the theme of the build. Ice Spear hits your opponent from a nice distance and does great damage, giving us an option to strike enemies anywhere and everywhere we want. Nobody will ever just hit us again from the distance without getting punished for it. Not only that, but Ice Spear is also really low cost, especially if you consider what you can do with it. Because at the same time, next to its great damage, it also builds up Frostbite from a distance. So we now also have an option to proc Frostbite from a distance and that is also not all because it also has amazing poise damage. So after a few applications of this Azure 4 on your enemies, you will always stance break your enemies and this gives you a lot of room to go in and completely destroy your opponent. Ice Spear is just too good and there's even one more reason that it's really good because it is an Ash of War that has really high base damage. As you can see I'm attacking Margit right now and this is with an unupgraded cold twin blade and no points spent into intelligence whatsoever which would affect the magic damage part of the twin blade which Ice Spear solely scales with and Ice Spear is already hitting like a truck in addition to it eventually proccing frostbite. This is great because you really don't want to invest points into intelligence with this build 
hold, at least not anytime soon. And thanks to Ice Spear's massive base damage and the ability to apply Frostbite, it thankfully compensates for that very well, making it great for a hybrid build like this where Arcane and Dexterity are just much more important stats. Now that we have covered the weapons, movesets, Ashes of Wars, everything really, this leaves just one aspect of combat that we need to talk about. Using jump attacks and the infinite bleed and frostbite proc machine that you can become with this build. So I already talked a little bit about it, but every time you jump attack, you hit your opponent six times within a second with the twin blades. These attacks, all these individual hits within just one attack will build up a ton of frost on your enemies with our cold twin blade and a ton of bleed with Eleonora's pole blade. And usually within every other jump attack, you will proc either bleed or frostbite or just both and you will just absolutely melt your opponents because you can just keep procking a status effect on your enemies like that. And this is thanks to the fact that Eleonora pole blade consists out of fire damage partially this means that every time when the fire of Eleonora's pole blade touches your enemies it removes the frostbite of them and you'll visually see this in game as well because the icy mist surrounding the enemy disappears as well and this is a very nice feature of my frost and blade build because usually if you apply frostbite on your enemies you can't proc the initial explosion of damage on them anymore after that instead you apply a debuff that will do other things for you which is nice for other types of builds but in this build we actively just want to keep proccing the initial frostbite explosion because it's just really easy with how many times you actually hit your opponents with twin blades to keep proccing it over and over and due to that you will get damage in much quicker compared to the plus 20% increased raw damage debuff that you would otherwise get from frostbite and then go the traditional route of just normally attacking after that. One final thing that is nice as well is that you can already start building up Frostbite in the distance with Ice Spear and then finish it when you get into melee territory with normal attacks or power sense attacks or do it the other way around, get the Frostbite proc when you're in the distance after building it up with jump attacks or power sense attacks in melee range. This is a really nice harmony that the build has because if things get dangerous in melee territory or in the distance you always can adapt to the situation. Now let's talk about the flask and the two crystal tiers that you want to get because you can get both of them at the start of the game. The first one is going to be the flame shrouding crack tier that you can get in the northwestern part of Kaled from killing the putrid avatar. This crystal tier will raise the damage of Eleonora's pearl blade directly because it will raise the fire damage on it, making it a very nice option because as you know we will just continuously hit things with Eleonora's pearl blade. So a buff to its damage directly is very nice and you can get it right at the start of the game. Then the other crystal tier you want to get is also in Kaled. This time it's going to be from a way more tanky and challenging Petrit Avatar near the minor air tree all the way in the east. This is just a copy paste of the Petrit Avatar we just faced but this one is actually on steroids and all kinds of other substances. Get hit and you die if you do this at the start of the game. But thankfully we are so OP with my bleed frost build. Nothing is too much of a challenge for us. Killing this putrid avatar will give you the stone barb crack tier and this crystal tier will increase the poise damage on all our hits and thus is especially nice with blood blade dance or jump attacks or really just in general the twin blades moveset. All these attacks already have nice poise damage but with this crystal tier in our flask we will stance break everything even faster making it just a very fast process to break any enemy in the game really. And killing this guy gives you a whopping 91k runes as well by the way, just the cherry on top. Just keep that in mind because you can use those runes and get like 10 more levels at the start of the game. And with that let's also talk a bit more about stats. With a hybrid build like this that applies two different status effects at the same time, your damage is going to scale through a lot of different stats and it can get quite messy and you can completely gimp your damage output if you don't approach your stats carefully. And really this is because pretty much every damage stat in the game is related to our twin blades with this bleed frost setup except for fate. 
but what you want to do with this build is definitely prioritize arcane and dexterity for your damage stats and just ignore intelligence unless you get to really high levels and you don't have much left to spend points on and the reason for this is because dexterity is the primary scaling attribute and linked to both of our twin blades and arcane does a lot for eleonora's pull blade damage output and its bloodlust build up at the same time so it is a very important stat while on the other hand, Intelligence is the lower scaling rate on our Cold Twin Blade, so only one of the two Twin Blades, and it's just not that important. It really has minimal influence on your damage output with this build. Around level 75, this is going to be a nice stat distribution, pretty much giving you something of everything. And then ultimately, if you start working towards a level 125 build with this setup, your stats could look something like this. For Arcane, you want to get at least 45 Arcane, so you cover the levels that give you relatively the largest increases to Bloodlust build up and you'll see this reflect into the graphs it's the juicy part of the graph and Eleonora's pole blade actually scales harder with arcane compared to dexterity and this might be a bit confusing because if you look at this weapon in game you'll see that dexterity has a higher letter scaling but if you do the comparisons you will see that investing points into arcane will still make your damage output higher and the reason for this weird phenomenon is pretty much thanks to Eleonora's pole blade being partially fire damage now for dexterity you also want to get around 45 I would say as both our twin blades scale well with dexterity and it's near dexterity's first soft cap for weapon damage. Then you want to get at least 40 vigor to reach the first soft cap of vigor and just be tanky in game and get that sustain going. Get around 20 mine to really be able to use both of our ashes of wars comfortably and then the rest of the points in endurance which will help out with our stamina and gear options. For a level 150 build I would get 50 vigor. 55 dexterity and 55 arcane this will make you reach both the first soft cap for dexterity as well as for arcane for weapon damage and you'll get more bloodless build up with that as well while becoming more tanky if you struggle a lot in pve or are a newer player or pvp a lot i would shave five points from both arcane and dexterity and then get 60 vigor instead Something else that you want to consider is after defeating Margaret, you will get another talisman pouch. And for this talisman slot, you definitely want to get the claw talisman. It is a talisman that you can get very early on in the game, in Stormveil to be precise, and it fits this build perfectly. It increases the damage output of our jump attacks, and as you know, we'll definitely be using those jump attacks frequently because they are just so good with a bleed frost twin blade build like this, and therefore the claw talisman will do wonders for this build. Now the last step in this video is going to be to really have the most powerful start for the most powerful bleed frost build and that is achieved by upgrading your weapons. You can get a weapon that upgrades through smithing stones to plus 16 really easy with my method that if you watched my previous get op early videos which you obviously have you know exactly what I'm talking about and a weapon that upgrades with somber smithing stones to at least plus 6 very easy as well. So let's go ahead and do that before we wrap up the video. Let's first get our cold twin blade to plus 16. For this you want to go to the Raya Lucaya crystal tunnel in Lernia. Go all the way to the bottom of this cave and fight the boss right there. Defeat him with both our twin blades, it should be an easy fight with all the poise damage in our kit and you will just completely break this guy. Killing this boss will net you the somber stone minor spell bearing to buy spitting stone 1 and 2. Then you want to go to the seal tunnel in the Alts plateau region. In the seal tunnel hit the hidden wall, go to the chest and pick up the second bell bearing to give you the possibility to buy smithing stone number 3 and number 4. Then you want to farm the miners here because they drop smithing stone number 5s. Do this until you have 12 smithing stone number 5s. When you have farmed enough smithing stone number 5s, move through the cave some more while hitting more of the hidden walls here. And eventually you will want to drop down to the room with the big abductor thing. Go to the, I don't know what it is, but it has light reading from its structure. Lure the abductor to it and when he moves towards you and hits the structure, he will break it open. And it will make it possible for you to loot 3 more smithing stones. This time it's a smithing stone number 6. Now you'll have all the smithing stones you need to be able to upgrade your cold twin blade all the way to level 16 at the very start of the game. For Eleanor's pull blade, we want to do the same thing, but with somber smithing stones and to plus 6. You can buy Somber Smithing Stone 1 to 4 for relatively cheap by talking to Ichi. Again, on the road to Caria Manor. He's right next to the Grace right here. 
so it is extremely easy to upgrade to weapon 2 plus 4 right away. Then you want to go to the dragon burnt runes and this time in fact take the teleporter chest right there because you are now a lot stronger than at the start of the video. Doing so will teleport you to the Celia crystal tunnel in Kaelid. Go outside of the tunnel, mount up and basically keep moving forward while hugging the right side of this area till you get to exactly this opening. Go to the right here and make your way to the end of the path where you will find the somber smithing stone number 5. There is also a somber smithing stone number 6 in the Celia crystal tunnel itself. You'll have to progress and move up and down various times. Ignore or kill off all the annoying ass enemies in this cave. Whatever you want to do, but just keep progressing till you get to the boss in this room exactly. This tunnel is also filled with smithing stone number 5s by the way. There should be at least 8 here, so you can shorten farming the miners for smithing stone number 5s quite a lot if you just pick all of the smithing stone number 5s right here. Now when you get to the boss, kill him. It shouldn't be that hard with how OP you are right now. And you'll get a somber smithing stone number 6 to get Eleanor's pull blade to plus 6. Having done all of that, you'll now have both of your weapons upgraded to really high levels and you'll now be the strongest Bleed and Frost Twin Blade build possible in the history of Bleed and Frost builds that you can also make at the start of the game. This video will also have a follow up where the Cold Blooded Flame gets a twist and becomes a different character based on things that unlock in the later parts of the game. For now you have the strongest possible bleed frost build that you can make at the start of the game that also has a lot of variety in it as well and every aspect of combat covered which makes it so much fun and you can now go ahead and just destroy everything in the game with my bleed frost build and just beat the entire game like that. However definitely stay tuned for the follow up video as well you don't want to miss it because if you thought that infinitely proccing two status effects bleed and frost at the same time was nice well wait till you see the late game version. Some arts of magic should just be forbidden and should be never taught to anyone. Some types of combat transcend any moral code in existence, but for those that only care about having an upper hand in combat to quickly disintegrate what they're facing, they will go to any extent to get that upper hand. They don't care, what is that shouldn't be left alone to rest in peace. No, they even make use of their spirits to torment them for eternity. These types of mages are shunned by everyone for their lack of moral code, but they are specialized in very potent magic arts and possess rare weapons that are so diverse and lethal, they destroy everyone instantly. So what are you truly going to do about it? What do you call a mage that has high intelligence but is also heavily involved with the gods, for the better or worse? Int and Fade is sometimes also called the Forbidden Duo. <coughs> okay, not really. I made it up. But it sounds cool, so we'll run with it. The reality is that making a hybrid build based on these two stats can be a bit complicated, to say the least. But in this video, and in the late game version of this video, you will see the true power that lays behind the Forbidden Duo. Now, let's cut straight to the case. There's only one weapon in the game that comes with scaling in both Fate and Intelligence. This is the Sword of Night and Flame. If you remember when Elden Ring launched, the Sword of Night and Flame was one of the strongest weapons in the game. But then the 17th of March 2022 came and it bitch slapped any Sword of Night and Flame enthusiasts right into the face. It was a very dark day for our sad little sword. It was completely nerfed. The sword barely lasted for 3 weeks enjoying its popularity. Afterwards it went missing from the world. And the few people that still wielded this sword after that dark day. Well let's just say they quit the game and are now playing Minecraft. But now it's about 7 months later and recently a patch went live. Changing Sword of Night and Flame yet again for the third time. Giving it multiple buffs and it is now back with a vengeance. Because this sword is incredibly powerful again. Add to that that a lot of sorceries and incantations that scale with Int and Fate got a buff as well. Making an Int Fate build now more interesting than it has ever been. Now there's no class that starts with both high levels in Fate as well as in Intelligence. So instead we have to determine what the most efficient option will be when adding up various stats. Doing so will make it apparent that the best class for an Int and Fate build will in fact be the Astrologer. 
due to its high stats in intelligence, mind and dexterity. All important stats for an int and fate build. So get the astrologer and start off with the golden seat as your keepsake to get that extra flask at the start. It is really the best option for any new playthrough. Now the nice thing about the sword of night and flame is that you can get it right at the start of the game. And I'll show you how to do that very quickly and efficiently. But first, we need to do the get OP early basics. And if you watch my previous videos and are familiar with this step, then skip ahead to the timestamp shown on the screen. If not, buckle up and let's get going. First of all, go to the gate front side of Grace, get your mount from Melina, then go back to the starting area right where you just met your BFF and mount and ride to the beach in the southern part of this place. It is really close to the starting area. On the beach you will find a golden pickled fowl food which you will want to use in a second. Then get the Morningstar weapon in the northern part of the Weeping Peninsula, so near Limgrave in the chest and it's now time to go to Kaelid. Go to the third church of Mary pick up the goodies that are laying around here for you to pick up and then go beyond the church and take the teleport. This will teleport you to exactly here on the map and you want to go south till you reach Fort Ferret. That's this spot on the map. Ignore all the enemies on the route to the fort no matter how big they are. And when you arrive at Fort Ferret, you want to pick up a very nice talisman. You want to ignore all the bats while you're running inside and move towards the ladder. Just run, climb up and then pick up the Dactus Medallion. This is very important, so don't forget to do that. Then keep moving till you get to the second gap and jump down. Move to the right of yours, pick up the golden rune that's laying around there and then jump to the sneaky pathway to your right. Keep moving till you can jump down again and there will be the Radican Source Heal. If you're not familiar with this talisman, it's a very good talisman that will help us out because it provides a lot of relevant stats right at the start of the game. Then go outside. Kill Grail, the big ass dragon, with your Morningstar weapon equipped so you proc bleed and kill him quickly. When the dragon is almost dead, make sure to pop the golden pickled fowl food that we just picked up so we get a bunch of extra runes. Now you'll have a bunch of runes and it's just really a nice way to get a good start as it's pretty much free. Now that we have done the standard get OP early stuff, we can start with the actual build. Make sure to also use the golden rune that you picked up inside the fort as well. Then go level up. The Sword of Night and Flame, relatively speaking, has quite some requirements in terms of stats for you to be able to wield it. It is beefy, but thankfully with us now having a bunch of runes just from this one kill, we can make sure we get all the stats we need and equip this sword right at the start of the game. In this case, make sure to get 24 Fate and 24 Intelligence and I would just put the rest in Vigor so you don't get one tapped by bosses or mobs and actually have some sustain. Now the Radican Sword Shield is really nice for the Death Mage just for the reason that it makes sure we fulfill the strength requirement of the Sword of Night and Flame without us ever having to spend a single point in strength. And it gives us a bunch of sustain with the points in Vigor and Endurance as well, which makes the early game just a lot smoother. Now it's time to pick up the trophy of the build, our sword. Leave Kaelid, go back to Limgrave and make sure to get into Lernia for this. You can bypass Stormbill like this. Then in Lernia, you want to move like this and get to Caria Manor. When you arrive at Caria Manor, you can immediately pick up a nice sorcery that also got a really significant buff recently and it makes using this sorcery a lot smoother now. Basically, just move like this till you get to the Scarab, kill the Scarab and you will get the Carrion Piercer sorcery. I was already recommending this sorcery before the recent buff, so for sure pick it up when you're here. It is really good. Now going back to the entrance, you want to progress till you get to the Manor lower level side of Grace basically. From this side of Grace, onwards it is pretty easy you just want to move like shown in the footage until you basically can jump onto a roof to your left here you'll see a hole in the distance where you can climb down do so and when you're down you will see a chest in that chest is the sword of night and flame yes Finally, we have it. Before we go over the sword, however, we need to upgrade it. Upgrading this sword in particular is really easy and fast, actually. Mostly because of its really convenient location. E.G. is a smith that sits near Carrier Manor, right here. You can go to him and he'll be right next to the side of Grace, in fact, as well. And you can buy Somber Smithing Stone 1, 2, 4 right away. E.G. also upgrades the sword for you at the same moment, so it is a two-in-one surface and yeah, really convenient. Now we'll have a plus for Sword of Night and Flame. But we want to go the full route and upgrade it all the way to plus six, so for this go back to Limgrave, go to the Dragon Burnt Rooms in Limgrave and take the teleporter chest. You will teleport to Celia Crystal Tunnel and you can run out of this place, then mount up and stick to the right side till there is a passage to your right. 
when you see the opening of the passage go inside of it and go all the way till the end and you will see a somber smithing stone number five for you to pick up now we're almost done but you want to go back to the seal crystal tunnel again where you just teleported to you want to progress through this place basically till you get to the falling star beast boss and usually when you're like playing a melee build this guy is a huge pain in the ass but haha <laughs> with sword of night and flame it is the easiest fight of your life just to him quickly no time to waste he will drop that shiny stone for you and go ahead and upgrade your sword to plus six now now you'll have a plus six sword of night and flame right at the start of the game Now before we get into the combat we need to do a few more things. First we need to get our staff for casting sorceries. Yet again we have to go back to the Celiac Crystal Tunnel. I hope you do like this place because as you will see you will be going here a lot. Go outside and mount up. Move something like this till you get to a staircase right there. And it will lead you to the great Roxing spell. Definitely pick that thing up because it is one of the best spells that you can pick up at the start of the game. It deals great damage and it also deals great poise damage. Meaning you will have a nice tool to stance break your opponents relatively easily. Near the spot you will also find the meteorite staff laying around here. Exactly here. Pick it up because that is without a doubt the best staff that you can pick up at the start of the game. The reason of this is that the meteorite staff has a very high scaling, a S tier scaling right from the get go. You don't have to go through any effort to upgrade it as you can't even upgrade it in the first place. But right from the start you'll have a staff with amazing scaling. So your sorceries will deal a lot more damage. It also boosts gravity sorceries and thankfully we just picked up a gravity sorcery that is probably also the best gravity sorcery in the game. Now the prince of that staff is the staff that actually fits this build thematically and functionally but it's the staff we'll be using in the follow-up video for two reasons basically the staff is in the deep root depths so it's basically impossible to get it at the start of the game and even if you get it with relatively low sets for int and fate it doesn't shine enough and the meteorite staff will easily beat it so definitely just use the meteorite staff early to mid game and you'll be good to go regarding gear there's really only one set that fits the team there's no contest we need to get the royal remain set for this you want to go back to Lurnia, pretty much all the way in the south, and keep moving towards the village of the Albanarks. When you get into this village, keep moving up the hill, basically till you can slap the shit out of the guy disguised as a pot. After doing some of that, he will show his true face and give you the right side of the Helic Tree Secret Medallion, which is like a nice thing for way later on in the late game. But most importantly, it functions as a trigger, because if you now go back to the round table hold, the Edge Lord that is usually quiet and doesn't want to talk to you, will now start attacking you and with our legendary sword of night and flame this fight is a complete joke and you just obliterate him you will get his entire set afterwards when you go to his usual standing spot this set fits thematically perfectly but more importantly it has a bunch of defensive stats for us so we can sustain hits even better now it also has this unique property that if you're really low HP, it will heal you in fact till you get around 18% of HP, which is nice if you have like poison on your ticking. It literally prevents you from dying from annoying damage over time effects. And in a general sense, it also just gives you this nice heal for free. So extra sustain. Get this gear set for sure. And if you want to be truly cool in line with your new drip, then make sure to give the video a like and subscribe if you're still not subscribed. You know you want to do it. For our Flask of Wonders physic, we definitely need to pick up the Intelligence Not Crystal tier. It is useful for making it possible to cast some of the sorceries we want to cast later on in this video, right at the start of the game. But more generally speaking, it also just gives us extra stats and does extra damage. You can pick up this Crystal tier right next to Caria Manor, where we just picked up our sword. For the second Crystal tier, you'll want to pick up the Magic Shrouding Crack tier. You can pick this up in the north of Lurnia as well, but it's in the eastern part of northern Lurnia. Go there and kill the earth tree avatar. This guy hits really hard but he's a pussy because he's afraid of fire. So make sure to use the fire aspect of night and flame stance and there you go. You will completely obliterate this tree or whatever it is in a few hits. Now with everything set we can start using the sword of night and flame and completely destroy everything in our path. 
Now when you start using the Sword of Night and Flame, you'll exactly know what I was talking about at the start of the video. It is extremely powerful again. With the Sword of Night and Flame's Night Stance, so when you use a normal attack after using the Ash of War, you'll get the Magic Beam. And you can already easily destroy everything with this massive beam of pure death. It will deal insane damage with our current setup. The beam also got buffs in its possibilities for its trajectory, so it is much easier to hit things with it now, when they are not on the same horizontal level as you. Then with the Sword of Night and Flames Flame Stance, so pressing R2, which is usually a heavy attack after using the Ash of War, you get this insane burst of flames. I would recommend you to use this aspect of the sword against groups of mobs and use it as your AoE ability basically, because it will scorch them to death pretty much instantly and deal a bunch of damage to a bunch of targets. I would also definitely use it against things that have either high resistances against magic damage or are extra vulnerable against fire. The flame stance will completely destroy whatever you're fighting in that case, exactly like you just saw with the Earth 3 avatar. And for all other situations, especially single target versus bosses, I would use the night stance and make quick work of whatever you're fighting like that. Now as you can see, the duality of the Sword of Night and Flame is really nice, it covers you for pretty much any situation in the game, and just with this sword alone you can just beat everything already. And you might think, this is a mage build, the blade will deal no damage when you actually use it as a sword. No, don't get it twisted, when you actually hit things with the blade of the sword, you one shot a lot of mobs as well. So you can do that as a nice trick to conserve FP, and you'll deal a bunch of damage as well. Easy. Now, we're not done yet, we are a death mage, and we have the armor, we have the looks, we have the mentality, and a really scary sword. But we have zero death sorceries now. So, what are we going to do about that? There are 5 death sorceries in the game, and you can get both the ranker call as well as the ancient death ranker at the start of the game. I would honestly just skip on ranker call, it is in every shape and form just a weaker ancient death ranker. It is less efficient when speaking in terms of mana cost, especially after the recent patch, it deals less damage and it sends out fewer spirits. Ancient Death Rancor, however, is going to be our main death sorcery that we're going to use. It is actually a really good sorcery and also really underrated in my opinion. Recently it got buffed as well, making it now even better than it already was and I will show you why in a second. But first we need to get it, so go back to Lernia again, go to the gate down north side of Grace, then move a bit south and you'll hear that the music will change. What could that possibly mean? I don't know. Well, maybe a giant bird trying to murder you. Exactly that. Kill this bird, it is supposed to be a higher level bird. But honestly, whether you want to nuke it right away or otherwise go for the safer option and spam rock sling from a distance, as you will in fact outrange this guy, you will ultimately kill him and get ancient death rancor. Ancient Death Ranker is really nice in combination with Sword of Night and Flame because as you see you will send up to 9 spirits to attack your enemies and every spirit individually staggers your enemy. So 9 in a row means a lot of time where the enemy is getting gangbanged by these spirits and they will be just standing there doing jack shit. They can't do anything about these annoying spirits and you get all the opportunity in those moments to completely destroy your enemy without them ever even touching you in any capacity. So you don't want to use this spell for its damage output, at least not yet in this phase of the game, but for the insane pressure that this sorcery applies on your enemies and all this control you get with it. Literally you can destroy late game enemies such as Electo even though we are still just level 36, just with this combo of using Ancient Death Rancor and Sword of Night Flames Night Stance, it is a very simple combo but extremely effective and lethal and you have all the control you need over any situation with this combo. In terms of design, Ancient that rancor is also just top tier look at those skulls get that thing now in regards to other sorceries unfortunately the thing with in fate sorceries and incantations is that a lot of them are locked behind progression the capital or they just don't really shine in the early and mid game yet so they will be rather a part of the mid to late game version of this build and trust me there's a lot more you can do with these sorceries and incantations than you might think so don't miss the follow-up video 
But with Ancient Death Rancor, we have a very solid sorcery that fits the theme as one of our main sorceries. You also want to complement the sorcery, however, and pick up some other sorceries, not Int and Fate sorceries specifically, but just generally good sorceries that you can actually pick up at the start of the game. So these are five sorceries that you can pick up early game that I truly do recommend, as they're just very good and complement the build in various ways and gives you a tool for any situation really. Rock Sling, as mentioned before, it is the best sorcery in the game that you can actually pick up at the start of the game. Carrion Piercer, as mentioned before as well. Then you want to pick up Carrion Greatsword, Carrion Slicer, and Glint Blade Phalanx. These three sorceries are really good and are really easy to get, especially when you're just starting out. And some of them actually also got a buff recently, making them very nice options. Since you have the Fate requirement, pretty much, you can also get a seal and get both Golden Vow and Flame Grant Me Strength to boost your damage output even more. I personally didn't use them in this video because as you saw the damage output is already insane so it is kind of pointless but yeah you could consider getting them as well to get even more op now after getting market as you saw earlier in this video you can get another talisman and for this slot i do truly recommend you to get the carrion filigree crest from eg the dude that upgraded our sword earlier in the video. The Carrion Filigree Crest will make the FP cost of using either the Flame or Night Stance of our Sword of Night and Flame significantly less, making life a lot easier for you early game and just gives you this opportunity to spam the Ash of War comfortably and yeah, do whatever you want. For this you have to go to the Mistwood area till you hear some particular individual howl then go to the Church of Ella and talk to the Merchant Kale. He will give you an emote. With this thing, our build is truly complete. We now have reached level 100 in epicness, coolness, and swagger. After getting the emote, go back to the woods. Use the emote when you see the wolf all the way up there. And he will jump off, break both his legs, no f**ks giving, and send you to kill Bloodhound Knight Darewill. Bloodhound Knight Darewill is in Limgrave as well, right here. Kill him, you will pretty much just one-shot him with how powerful you are. The guy is a joke. After reloading the area, talk to Blade again, go to EG, use the dialogue options and then the Carrion Filigree Crest will appear in fact in his shop. With this second talisman in your kit, you will now be so powerful, it is insane. Now like I said, this is not all. This is my get OP early video for an Int and Fate build, but there is a lot more to an Int and Fate build. Therefore, this video will have a follow-up where the Death Mage gets a twist and becomes a different character based on things that unlock in the later parts of the game. For now, you have the strongest possible Int Fate build that you can possibly make at the start of the game that also has a lot of variety in it as well, which makes it so much fun and you can already just destroy the entire game with my Death Mage build like this. The Sword of Night and Flame is so good again after the recent patch and it's a ton of fun to use, so I'm very happy that this thing is now a beast again. However, definitely stay Stay tuned for the follow up video, you don't want to miss it. Don't forget to give the video a like, subscribe and hit the bell thing so you're the first to get notified when I upload something and let me know your thoughts in the comments. So you want to be a mage that uses incantations as their primary source of damage in Elden Ring? Using incantations as your primary source of damage seems to be underrated. People seem to think the actual powerful ones take too long to cast and you won't get them off and all the other ones are just useless or sorceries are just going to be a better option. Well that's not really true and for that reason I will today show you a very powerful build where we use incantations as our primary source of damage and the best thing about this is that you can become very powerful and OP at the literal start of the game with the build that I'm going to show you. For our class we're going to go with the Prophet this time. The points in Fate and Arcane that this class gives you at the start is exactly what we need for this build. Our keepsake is going to be the Golden Seed. An extra flask at the start of the game to restore our FP is just too good to pass up on. Now when you enter the game you will see that you start out with Catch Flame and Heal. Catch Flame is really good in terms of damage and it's pretty much the Prophet's Carrion Slicer but its range is incredibly short, so it's only going to be situationally good. And heal is, well, something that heals you. It has some extra utility in the fact that you can use it to also damage enemies. And it's very good versus the undead type of enemies as it's holy damage in fact, but for now we don't need that as well. So what we're going to do instead is right from the start, while we're still at the first grace in the game, start working on our build. And considering there's an incredibly powerful seal right here in the starting area, we will start off with getting our weapons this time. We will want to enter the fog wall right here for this, but to do this we need to get two stone sword keys. 
Thankfully there are two stone sword keys in Limgrave, not too far away from here. Get your horse to make things faster and go to Stormhill Shack right here. And when you're there, pick up the stone sword key that you can loot from the body. Don't forget to talk to Rodrika three times to get the jellyfish summon, which is definitely a decent summon for the early game. The second stone sword key can be found in the dragon burnt runes right here. Pick that one up as well and now you have done all the preparatory work to open the fog gate. Open the gate and now you have to progress through this cave and if you're doing this at the start of the game like I'm doing, you will probably die a few times before you get it down and the enemies here will hurt you in fact. But basically you will want to avoid the massive death machine that you probably have noticed by now and just progress upwards till you see this guy. He in fact has the key to this build on him and you can definitely try to take him down one versus one with your starter stuff and low FP and health. But it's probably not recommended and at this point of the game you might still be too weak to do that. So an easy way to just get him killed is by luring him outside the chamber and let him get ran over by that pain in the ass thing which now as you can see actually has some kind of use to it. It's just too efficient to do it like that. And accordingly loot the dragon communion seal. This seal is incredibly good and it's going to be our primary weapon. Our secondary weapon is thankfully nearby as well. You want to go to this spot on the map for it. When you arrive here, you will get invaded by Bloody Finger Nerichus. Now again, since it's the start of the game, you might not be able to take him down, as he is just simply a lot higher in level than you. But just wait a bit and the game will summon another guy that is going to help us. He will tank the fight for you and meanwhile you can just spam catch flame or attack him with your spear. When you get him down you will be rewarded with the Redufia dagger. This is a really powerful and fast attacking dagger that complements our build very well and we will use it for the early to mid game. I will talk about these weapons a bit later in this video and why we actually want to use them. But for now we need to keep moving because we're going to go to everybody's favorite region in the game. Gale. On the road, try to get 3 levels in Arcane till it's at 13. Now go back to the Dragon Burnt Runes where we picked up the second Stone Sword key earlier in this video. But this time go down the stairs and interact with the chest. If you're already familiar with this chest then just act all surprised. If not then this is actually a trap that's going to teleport us to Kaelid. It will make things a lot faster. It will teleport us to this cave specifically and you will want to run outside of it as fast as possible because the enemies are going to destroy you. Get the grace, mount up and now you want to go and move through Kaled something like this. We're going to go and pick up our first talisman and meet Greyroll. And the reason why you want to take this route is mostly because it just opens up Kaled a lot and you'll touch a lot of graces on the road. Which is going to be very useful for later and especially because there are several points of interest for us on this particular route. Eventually when you complete the route you will end up at Fort Ferret. When you are at the fort go inside and ignore all the bats and just run towards the ladder. When you get to the ladder climb up the ladder. When you are at the roof jump to the other side and run some more till you can jump down this second big hole. Then when you jump down that hole take a turn to the right. Move some more till you see a hidden path to your right again, jump on that and keep progressing till you can jump down again. In this part of the fort you will find Redicon's Sword Shield and I've talked about this talisman before but it's an incredibly useful talisman that's going to give us a bunch of stats and levels for free. And we're going to get all of these levels right at the start. Equip the talisman and now you also have all the requirements to wear the Redufia dagger and it's time to go and kill Greyroll. Greyroll is the giant ass dragon taking a nap outside of Fort Ferret. The problem with taking him down however, even though he's doing nothing, he still has a lot of HP. So you will want to pick up a weapon with a bleed built in. And thankfully the Redufia dagger that we picked up earlier has exactly that. As you can see, every few hits that you hit him with the dagger, you will instantly see big numbers pop up on the screen. This is when your daggers bleed procs and just keep doing that and eventually you will kill Greyroll. When you do so you get a bunch of runes which is definitely useful but not really that important in this case as you can get that anywhere. What's mostly important is that we get 5 dragon hearts and this opens up our build. Now when you think of incantations and especially powerful incantations you cannot miss the dragon incantations in your build. They are very powerful and overall deal the most damage out of any incantation in the game even when you barely have any investments in your stats which makes them such a good option. And 
And with going out of our way to go to Kaelid and kill Greyrule, we already have access to a bunch of them right from the start. Add to that that the seal that we picked up earlier scales of arcane and fate but also boosts the already hard hitting dragon incantations with a lot of extra damage. The seal also ultimately gets S tier scaling in arcane and thus gets even better and better and definitely something you'll want to pick up. It is a common misconception that you need to have fate to actually get the best damage out of fate based incantations. The numbers you see on the incantations are just requirements and do not matter that much in terms of which stat you actually want to invest points in to scale your incantations. What actually matters is the seal that you use to cast your incantations and how that seal in particular has its scalings. And accordingly to those stats that's how you're going to invest your points. So in this case we're going to primarily invest points into Arcane as it gets a S tier scaling later on and only invest points into Fate as much as we need to be able to use all the incantations that we are going to use. The hybrid scaling on the seal makes this an excellent way to spend your points and will maximize our damage output. Now the Reduvia dagger fits in with this really well as well and it's so powerful that you could also just run a build based on that but we are going to use it as a secondary weapon because it's a weapon with arcane scaling and investing points into arcane will make it proc its bleed even faster but it's also a very fast weapon that you can just use to kill off enemies quickly when you don't want to waste FP. Using these two weapons together is going to make a very powerful combination. So definitely pick them up both. Now Greyroll also gave us a bunch of runes that you can use to level up and meet all the requirements for the dragon incantations. So for that get 28 fate and 17 arcane and spend 1 point into endurance and then finally put the rest into mind. With that you will have met all the requirements for the dragon incantations in the game. Even the ones you won't be using right now but for the late game. Now this build works with low numbers in damage stats. This is because the dragon Dragon incantations have a very high scaling so even when our damage stats such as arcane and fate are only in the tens and the twenties you will still deal insane damage but the dragon incantations drain your fp very quickly and while casting them you are definitely vulnerable and this build really starts to shine when you up your survivability and sustainability because the damage is already all there if you would go all out on the damage stats like you would with say an intelligence mage build then it's just not going to work well Sorceries have a completely different scaling compared to dragon incantations, so that type of point investment is not optimal here. That's why we need more mind and more vigor. These are going to be our focus for at least the next 20 levels. So after spending the runes you got from Greyroll, you'll want to get to at least 20 vigor during the next few levels, prioritize that, and after getting 20 vigor start investing more points into mind till you have around 30. And for our damage stat, keep investing points into Arcane, as our seal scales primarily with Arcane. We have met the fate requirements for all the spells that we will be using for a very long time, so don't worry about spending points into fate, it's going to be on standby for now. Just use all your points for Arcane next to Vigor and Mind. Your next goal should be to get Arcane to at least 45, Vigor to 40 and Mind to 30. This will guide you and will cover you for about the next 50 levels. Now the good part start, because we are going to pick up our first OP incantations. Go to the Cathedral of Dragon Communion in Kaelid, pick up Rotten Breath, Dragon Claw and Dragon Eyes, and you'll have two Dragon Hearts left from the five we picked up from Greyroll but we will use them later on. From here on out you can start destroying every boss in the game. Even with our seal still stuck on very low tier scalings, the Scarlet Rot that Rotten Bread applies on bosses will one shot a lot of them. And you can definitely start playing the game like this without even making the build stronger or watching the rest of this guide. This is already a very good basis that you have. With our selection of dragon incantations you always want to use Rotten Breath as a staple spell. As the Scarlet Rot it gives your enemies is just simply too good. Then you want to follow up with the Dragon Eyes which will proc Frostbite for you and deal insane damage as well. And if the enemy you're fighting is close to you, you can use Dragon Claw for incredible close range AoE damage. And you can use Dragon Claw twice in a row by the way, which versus a lot of bosses and enemies in the game will stagger them and in many cases also just kill them off. To make it even better, all of these spells are AoE spells as well, so you can clear entire groups of mobs within a second. And you can also use these incantations to push off enemies of cliffs by the way, that's also a nice extra feature that they have. They're just extremely powerful and fun to use. Now with the gear you start off with, you are still too squishy at this point. You don't even get gauntlets as a profit. That's how bad it is. And now that we're getting OP and transcending, we can't keep wearing this shit. <laughs> Remember the point we spent in the endurance earlier and the thing I said about survivability? Well, it's time to get our gear. Especially because you want to prevent this in particular from happening as much as possible. 
this is collapsing and it will ruin your momentum as a incantations mage completely we want to get our poise to 56 at least and with that you will have reached the fourth threshold of the poise thresholds in the game and this is a very significant threshold and probably the most important one with it you will reduce your chances of collapsing significantly thankfully it all ties in together because right outside the cathedral of dragon communion where we just got our incantations there are two banished knights that drop an amazing set that gives you a lot of extra defensive stats and exactly 56 poise so go and farm them, keep killing them until they drop the entire set, and when they do so, equip all of it. And not only is this set very good in terms of stats, it also just looks really good as well, and it's one of my favorite sets in the game. There is just one problem with all of this though. This is all heavy armor, and it will force you into rolling like a clown. We need to get that medium equip load roll back as soon as possible. So, for our second talisman we want to get the Great Jars Arsenal, it's a really great talisman that will make it so that we can use medium rolls with our current stats, we don't need to invest more points in endurance, while at the same time we're going all out in gear and are wearing heavy armor. You can get this talisman in Kaled as well, you will have to go through the Siofra River for this, which is an underground area that you can access via Limgrave. So go to the Siofra River well in Limgrave and take the elevator there to go down. Take two stone sword keys with you by the way, that's pretty important because otherwise you can't access it. And when you're down underground, take the next elevator when you go outside. There are also a bunch of runes in this area and considering we are still at the start of the game, it's going to be useful to pick those up. Now we have taken the second elevator to go to the second area, you will want to go all the way north to the next elevator. Move towards there, it's a very linear path, just go north. And when you arrive there, use your stone sword keys and go back into Kaled again. Now just move forward till you arrive at the huge jar. The fastest thing to do is ignore the giants or kill them if you are in a good mood. If you ignore the giants and you want to de-aggro the one shooting arrows at you, take cover behind the jar, go to your menu, log out and then log in again and he won't shoot anything at you anymore. Now to get the talisman we need to defeat 3 invaders in a row back to back without a break and I think they are at least level 100 so if you're doing this at the very start of the game you will have difficulties in defeating them. If that's the case just go to this spot exactly where I'm going. They will instead one by one fall off the cliff like a bunch of idiots. If they get stuck at the wall, just move around a bit to let the AI read pad and then they will go for you instead. Now this is the easiest way in the history of Elden Ring to get a S tier talisman in Elden Ring at the start of the game. Now that you have this talisman, equip it and we can use our medium roll again and we are also full heavy armor, have a bunch of defensive stats, have high poise and our survivability is incredibly good while our damage output is also insane. With this we counter the dragon breath's only weakness, namely that they take time to cast. Even if something happens to us during the cast, we won't collapse as easily as previously. We will sustain hits mid cast and if we get interrupted we won't take a lot of damage so we will just be able to reposition and cast again. Even though the damage is very good, our shield has still very bad scalings at this point in the game and it's definitely suppressing the true potential of the build and you can actually get it to S tier at the start of the game as well. But really the main purpose of doing this is really just going to be speeding up you killing everything. For the seal to get S tier scaling we have to get it to plus 7 but for some reason getting a somber smithing stone number 7 is going to require a lot more effort than getting a somber smithing stone 8 and 9 which are really easy to get for us specifically now that we visit grey roll and unlocked a lot of Gaelic. For somber smithing stone 1 to 4 you can just buy them from EG in Lernia, he's very close to the northern Lernia lakeshore. Somber Smithing Stone 5 is really close to the grace of the cave that the trap sent us to earlier in this video. You just have to go out of the cave then take a right turn and just keep moving till you get to the stone and pick it up. For Somber Smithing Stone 6 and 7 we unfortunately have to go to Volcano Manor at this stage of the game. Thankfully it is accessible at the start of the game. We'll just have to go to Raya Lucaria Academy. There is a hidden teleport over there that brings us to Somber Smithing Stone 6 and 7. For this we need to first pick up the key that unlocks the academy. Thankfully there is a good convenience here as the dragon right here is on our kill list in fact. So while you're here kill the dragon as well and loot the key. 
enter the Raya Lucaria Academy and whether you want to kill everybody in your path or just ignore them all is up to you. Keep moving till you get to the graveyard, then get on the elevator thing and let it make you go all the way till the bottom. You will get a surprise visit from this guy, let him grab you on purpose and unfortunately he will do some questionable things to you while you're inside but when you die you will teleport to Volcano Manor in fact. It's very convenient and now that we are in Volcano Manor, move forward so you get to the rock formation right here and jump down the lava. Get to the other side quickly, as quickly as possible, don't die, that's quite important and start moving to the right towards the stairs. Go up the stairs, ignore the serpent warrior and take a left and go to the roofs. Now that you're on the roofs, just move exactly like I'm doing, basically just move a bit forward and you will find a somber smithing stone 6 right here on one of them. Now go back to the spot where you were before, you jumped on the roofs, go up the stairs again and this time instead of going to the left, take the elevator. Taking the elevator gets you here and you'll want to just move forward, ignore the guy that's standing in your path but do go up the stairs and take a turn to the left and you'll see something that you can push. Pushing this handle will create a bridge for you which is very convenient because our somber smithing stone number 7 is on the other side of the bridge. Now cross the bridge, jump on the little elevation that you'll find here, then jump on the platform right here as well, go to the highest point essentially and jump towards the ledge on the other side. And the body that's laying there will have a somber smithing stone number 7 for you to pick up. A little warning though because the jump is actually really annoying and it will definitely take several attempts to get it down but like always I have faith in you. For somber smithing stone 8 and 9 go to Kaelid to the northeastern part. Number 8 is going to be exactly here. Kill the scarab and it will drop it for you. Number 9 is going to be close as well. It's going to be exactly here. On a body that's sitting on a chair. Pick that up as well. And congratulations, you're finished now and can get your seal all the way to plus 9 at the start of the game. Going from C tier to S tier is going to be very noticeable because now you don't even have to wait anymore for Scarlet World to kick in versus many enemies. So if you don't have a lot of patience then this upgrade is going to make your life a lot better. Now the most fun part is going to start because we are going to finish our roster of incantations basically. First we want to get more dragon incantations and for that we want to kill everybody on this list. For Exekes you want to go back to the cathedral where we got our dragon incantations. He will be right outside. Kill him, it should be relatively easy now that you have a S tier seal with OP incantations. Now when you kill him you will get a dragon heart but it will also unlock the Exicus DK incantation and get that incantation for sure. It's the upgraded version of Rotten Breath basically and it does insane damage. You'll want to use Rotten Breath if you are mounted or if you want to be conservative with your FP but if you want to go all out just use Exicus DK and it will do a very good job at nuking whatever you're facing. Also, remember the dragon we killed earlier when we were en route to the academy? By doing that we unlocked Smark's Glintstone Breath, which is a very hard hitting spell. It does not work around debuffs and it does not apply damage over time, but it is the hardest hitting pure damage dragon breath in the game. Definitely get it as well, you will one shot a lot of bosses with it. Now we have 5 incantations and we want to kill some more dragons. Go kill Agil in the dragon burnt runes, this should be a familiar place by now and he will be the easiest to kill. Doing so unlocks the upgraded flame bread incantation and also go to the northeastern part of Kaelid for the last dragon on our list for now where we will find Grail, kill him as well and that should leave you with two more dragon hearts. What you want to get now is really up to preference but at this point in the game flame bread is probably going to be the most useful option as it will give us a fire spell and with that covers another type of elemental damage and it will also just hit really hard versus several types of enemies in the game. Now we have 6 different dragon incantations, for now we're going to leave the other dragon incantations on standby. It's time to complement our bundle of dragon incantations with some other types of incantations. We want to pick up something that we can use as a long range, high burst, staple spell that also casts quickly, as we don't really have something that exactly fits those 3 criteria yet. Welcome to Lightning Spear, it's too good and you can get it by getting the prayer brook from a mob that walks around in Lernia of the Lakes right here. Kill him and he will drop the dragon cult prayer book. Take it with you and go to the turtle nearby in the church of vows, trade it in and buy that spell. 
Now we want to pick up an even cooler spell that's also extremely good. For this, go to the Weepy Peninsula area south of Limgrave. Go to the Kalu Baptismal Church. Everybody is crazy here, so be careful for that. But you will be able to loot it from a body right here in this church. This is the Flame of the Frenzy spell. It's a very good option as well. It staggers, it builds up madness on your enemies, and it does great AoE damage. And it makes you look so cool as you cast it through your eyes. Uh, yeah... Next up we want to pick up something from the Black Flame School so we really become as versatile as can be. For this you want to go to Stormvale, then go to the left side chamber grace and go outside. Move all the way through the courtyard till you get to the other side and then go down the sneaky stairs. The spell that we want is behind the fog gate so take a stone sword key with you and then the spell will be in a chest for you in this room. It is a prayer book again so you'll have to turn it in. This time do it at the NPC at the round table hold. And you will be able to get Black Flame, which is a very quick spell that you can spam or charge every time. And it has the unique future that after it hits, it will also sap additional HP from the enemy based on a percentage. And therefore it's especially effective versus enemies with those large health pools, like bosses for example. And I have noticed a trend here because all the incantations that we have picked up look very cool. Also make sure to keep your memory slots up to date so you can actually cast all of these spells at the same time. I have covered where to get all of the memory stones in the game in previous videos so I will put a link to that in the description. Playing with incantations gives you room for a lot of extra utility in your kit. You can for example heal yourself. But with these incantations we have very hard hitting pure damage options. But we also can apply various debuffs on enemies and you will dominate the game just like this. But if you feel like you need utility in the form of damage buffs then either Golden Vow is going to be incredibly good because it boosts all our spells or flame grant me strength which will boost our fire spells specifically but with a higher percentage and you can combine these two as well by the way if you want to go all out now finally for our flask at some point you definitely want to pick up the cerulean hidden tier but it's not really a thing that you pick up in the early game so i won't cover it in this video for now it's good to have like a mix of something defensive and something offensive Use the opaline bubble tier for a shield that negates incoming damage that you can pick up from killing the earth tree avatar near the minor air tree in the weeping peninsula area. A very good option to mix it with is the flame shrouding crack tier that you can pick up in Kaelid near the smoldering church. You'll have to defeat the putrid avatar boss right there and when you do so he will drop it for you. This component will boost at least three different spells in our current rotation and it's going to be much more noticeable and better than just boosting fate with a raw number. Also make sure to keep picking up sacred tears and golden seeds on the road and like with a mage build distribute your flasks to be favored in terms of FP. Now the more FP flasks you get the stronger you're going to get because with more flasks you can channel your dragon incantations over and over. Now there are still a bunch of other interesting options and powerful incantations in the game that unlock in the later stages of the game. Therefore I will make a follow up video for the late game specifically and we will optimize the build and make it the absolute most powerful. But that's optimization. For now you already have an incredibly powerful OP and fun build that you're going to destroy the game with. Whether it's PvE or PvP. And more importantly that you can make at the start of the game. And due to how the incantations work that we have, the build only gets better and better as you progress in the game i hope you enjoyed the video good luck and have fun using this build leave a like that would help out a lot subscribe to your boy and hit the bell thing as well so you never miss out on anything and leave your thoughts in the comments The way of the samurai is defined by high prestige, fervor for combat and the possession of deadly weapon skills. Characterized by being proficient in the art of dual wielding weapons, the samurai historically had great success. By adhering to the Bushido codes of indifference to pain, eagerness for mastering the sword and successfully and honorably engaging in many many battles, we will use the same principles in Elden Ring to completely destroy everything in our path. And today I will show you the most powerful and OP samurai build that is incredibly fun to use and more importantly that you can make at the very start of the game, as always. For making the most powerful samurai in Elden Ring we want to pick the samurai starter class in Elden Ring, surprise surprise. 
for the keepsake it doesn't really matter what you pick because we're going to make something so OP in this video the keepsake is merely an afterthought but golden seed is always great having an additional flask is always good when you pick the samurai you start out with the uchi katana and a bow the uchi katana is a really good weapon it's probably the best starting weapon in the game due to all the flexibility it brings to the table so we're going to use that for sure in some way or another The bow is not going to be relevant for this build and we will pick up something better for ranged damage so right away you can just throw it in the bin goodbye bow our journey together was short but i will not forget about you now straight from leaving the starting area get your mount and go to Kaled. if you're familiar with my previous builds you know exactly what i'm talking about and where i'm going with this but for this build up this pickup is going to be god tier so go to the dragon burn runes and take the teleport to Kaled. now move around Kaled like this to fully unlock it with all the sites of graces on your road which will be very useful for later and finally you will end up at fort ferret in fort ferret you want to ignore all the bats as always and when you climb up the ladder make sure to pick up the medallion in the chest this is very important then keep moving forward on the roof until you can jump down the gap and ultimately pick up the radican sword shield this talisman gives you a whopping plus 20 in various stats that are all going to be very relevant and great for us so this is really a no-brainer pickup that you can get at the very start of the game then go ahead and kill gray he's right outside the fort thankfully since our uchi katana can proc bleed on enemies you will kill him quite fast and if you want more runes from him use a gold pickled foul food to increase the runes you get from him with a whopping plus 30 percent you can pick one up in limgrave quite easily it's pretty close to the starting area right here now when you finally kill this guy and got an arthritis in your hands you will get a bunch of runes and with these runes you will go from level 10 all the way to level 35 and you'll want to spend your points somewhat along the following lines get at least 20 vigor and at least 20 endurance then put one point into strength then put about seven points in dexterity and like three points in arcane or so and i will explain to you why later on now that you have done that you're quite beefy and it will make everything a lot easier just from the get-go figure is very important for the sam right early on and endurance will help you out with your survivability and stamina usage in addition we also still get a good number of points for our damage stats and now that they've done all of that it's really time to start working on making the most powerful build now the next step will be to go to fort hide in limgrave and when you arrive at this place go all the way to the top loot the chest to get the left part of the Dectus medallion and also kill the soldier you find here when you do so he will give you the bloody slash ash of war now let me tell you this is easily one of the best ashes of wars in the game and it's going to fit our build very well You'll want to use it as your main Ash of War so put it on the weapon in the right hand and use it as an option to just slice through everything. It deals insane damage and it will simply just one shot a lot of mobs in the game. In the rare cases where it doesn't kill your enemy it will still poise break them either way and you can just start spamming it and still get the kill quickly without them ever touching you. You can even use it behind walls to erase some of the most annoying mobs in the game instantly. And finally, not only versus mobs is it going to be very powerful, but it's also going to be an incredible option versus bosses. It will trivialize a lot of them. Now that we have a useful skill, it's time to go pick up our main weapon and start using our Uchi Katana for its intended purpose. For this, you want to go to Yura. He will be at the seaside runes under the overpass and talk to him to start his quest. Now for his quest line, we need to kill two bosses. The first is very close, it's near the Murkwater cave and you'll have to kill Norigius. It should be quite easy because in both fights, Yuri himself will help you out. So basically you're just cheating and it's a two versus one situation and you can use the Uchi Katana or spam Bloody Slush to make quick work of the opponent. After doing that, you'll want to go to the entrance of the Raya Lucaria Academy, interact with the red sign and you'll find the Raven Mount Assassin fighting Yura. Again, do the same thing, kill the guy and when you do so, it will give you an Ash of War that is otherwise missable if you would have just just killed Yura at the start. Now after doing this talk to Yura at the bridge, exhaust his dialogue options and then go to the Altus Plateau region and thankfully we did pick up both sides of the medallion conveniently when we were picking up stuff for our build so you can just straight away enter this region when you go to the bridge and unlock it for later. When you get into the Altus Plateau region, go to the second church of Marika and Yira will lay on the ground there and give you his sword, the Nagakiba. 
the Nagakiba is a katana as well and essentially it's an upgraded Uchi Katana. It has incredible range and it's pretty much twice the size of the Uchi Katana which makes it so good for poking enemies and using the range of its thrust attack to catch enemies off guard or finish them off reliably or attack them without them having a chance of attacking you. The difference in range between the Nagakiba compared to the Uchi Katana is really noticeable. We are however going to dual wield our Katanas and make use of the Nagakiba's range by equipping it in our main hand, the right hand and the Uchi Katana in our left hand. The Nagakiba's extended range makes this the best dual Katana wield setup that you can make at the start of the game. As both weapons are katanas, we can power stance with these weapons and deal massive damage that way quickly by pressing L1. But it's going to get even better in a second. But let's first pick up our second Ash of War, which is also here in the Altus Plateau region and it's close by. You will want to go to this spot exactly and you'll find a scarab in the air here. Now you and I know exactly what is going to happen next, this porting is going to be massacred and when you do so it will drop the Blood Blade Ash of War for you. <laughs> and this is going to be the second Ash of War that you will want to use in this build. This is a really good Ash of War because you can use it to deal damage from a distance and otherwise you can use it to proc bleed and just kill whatever is in the distance really easily. With two Ashes of War and Bloody Slash on our main weapon, you can use this one on our Uchi Katana and then when you two hand the Uchi Katana, you will be able to cast it like that. Also, what's really important to note as well is that both of our Ashes of War give the bleed affinity to our Katanas, next to being very powerful Ashes of War on their own. Getting this affinity makes our Nakakiba and Uchi Katana both scale with Arcane and give it a bunch of extra blood loss build up, which means we will proc bleed much faster now and next that we will have a high scaling with dexterity as well. If you would want to apply bleed or arcane related affinities to a weapon manually, you can only do so with the black wet blade, which you can only unlock after killing Radon. But now we have both our weapons infused with bleed at the very start of the game, which is really nice because as you can see, it perfectly fits the idea of the build. We have just one problem though, we have two weapons that are still unupgraded and thus we won't really see much of any of the benefits that I mentioned yet. And both of these weapons can only be upgraded with the normal smithing stones which are a real pain in the ass to get in the early game. And we have two katanas so we have to do the whole upgrading thing twice. But your boy has got you covered. Now it's possible to get both our katanas all the way to plus 15 at the start of the game. Smithing stones 6 and higher are pretty much locked behind the capital and the snowy areas, but getting both katanas all the way to plus 15 is more than enough for now. We will need 120 smithing stones in total for that though, and I'm going to be honest guys, I don't want to make this video 8 hours long and send you to like 69 different locations, because they are all spread over the map, so I thought of a way to do this by sending you to two locations and two locations only and make it possible to obtain 120 smithing stones pretty quickly. Now for getting smithing stone 1 and 2 we can just simply get the smithing stone miners bell bearing that you can find in Lurnia in the Raya Lucaria crystal tunnel. As always when you enter this cave ignore every enemy here these are very annoying enemies but just ignore them and get down all the way till you reach the boss. You will have to fight this guy when you reach the bottom of the cave however and I can already see you almost clicking the video away because with its immunity to bleed and our katana is pretty much doing nothing you would think this is a done deal right and the build ends here Just spam bloody slash a few times till you rip off his armor and it should be easy peasy lemon squeezy from that point onwards. Congratulations, you have killed him and you now have the possibility to buy smithing stone 1 and 2. These are only going to get us to plus 6 though, but we can also get smithing stone miners bell bearing number 2 right at the start of the game as well, even though it's really far into the world. But thankfully we unlocked the Altus Plateau region just a moment ago to get our badass Nagakiba, so it's going to be really easy to get here now. For this you want to go to the sealed tunnel and yes you can access this at the start of the game as well. And when you enter you will have to hit a hidden wall to the right of the entrance. Doing so will make it possible for you to access an area with a bunch of miners and you will have to walk through this area to get to a chest and in that chest will be a smithing stone miners bell bearing number 2. 
This will give us the option to buy smithing stone number three and number four. And with that, we will be able to get to plus 12. So two more things. How the fuck are we going to pay for all these smithing stones? And what about going from plus 12 to plus 15? After patch 1.03, buying smithing stones became a lot cheaper than it originally was. All smithing stones now only cost 25% of what they originally used to cost. So this is now a much more feasible way to upgrade your weapons, especially at the very start of the game. We're going to get smithing stone 5 and get all the runes we need at the same time. And for this we can stay in the sealed tunnel. See all these miners here drop smithing stone number 5 and we need 24 of these smithing stones in total. So farm these guys like you absolutely hate them and just reset every time when you have cleaned the area next to the grace. You don't need to go any further into the cave for this. While farming they will also give you a bunch of runes as well so it's pretty much a two birds one stone type of situation and every time you get like 5k or 10k runes you can go back to the round table hole to upgrade your weapons and then go back to farming and see your weapons become stronger in real time you will want to keep doing this until you have all these smithing stones you need to upgrade both weapons to plus 15 these guys do have a bunch of armor though so be careful with that and just jump into a power stance attack and try to get the bleed proc that way relatively safely. When you get the bleed proc they will always die. Now how long this is going to take will all depend on RNG. Sometimes you will get the smithing stones back to back and sometimes you will get zero new smithing stones before you reset the area again. So it really all depends on RNG and how lucky you are in the game. But in my experience it shouldn't take too long and it's kind of fun to just farm them and see the build getting stronger and stronger as you can just keep upgrading your stuff every few minutes. There's also that cave by the way that we teleported to earlier in this video to get to kale it. That cave has 8 smithing stone number 5s as well. So to make things faster you can loot 8 of them right there and then just only need 16 more from the miners right here. When you're finished you will have both weapons at plus 15 and well you will just destroy everything basically now. We just need some better gear now because we did spend a good number of points in endurance and we are not using all that juicy extra equip load that we have. <laughs> So for our gear you want to go and get the clean rod set, it's dropped by the clean rod knights in Kaelid in the swamp of Aeonia. Using bloody slash will make quick work of them and again just farm them until they drop the entire set for you. When you get the entire set your defenses will get a massive increase in stats compared to the samurai set as you can see. You will have a bunch of poise as well now and to top it all off this set has a really unique and cool aesthetic as well. And you will be still in the medium load category bordering the heavy load category. So we are definitely making good use of all the extra equip load that we got. Regarding the flask you want to pick up the crimson burst crystal tier and the opaline bubble tier in the weeping peninsula area. The crimson burst crystal tier will keep restoring our HP for 3 minutes long so it compensates for the HP loss with bloody slash. Combine it with the opaline bubble tier for a good defensive flask. If you want a more offensive flask then you can also pick up the dexterity Nold crystal tier and swap one of these crystal tiers to add 10 points to dexterity every time you use the flask which is definitely a very nice bonus in the early and mid game. Regarding leveling our stats beyond the initial leveling up that we did with the runes from killing grail you want to place a priority on getting 40 vigor in the early and mid game because with the upgrades to our weapons we have a lot of damage for now. Preferably also get some more endurance when you get between level 50 and level 100. 30 endurance should be fine for this build and you will get more options for gear as well. For the damage stats you'll want a good mix of dexterity and arcane and leaning more towards dexterity since it is our highest scaling stat. Dexterity's first soft cap is at level 55 so that's what you'll want to aim towards too. Then also invest points in arcane till you get at least level 30 I would say as it will help out nicely with making it faster to build a bleed on the enemy. Most gain for building up the bleed status effect via arcane is between level 20 and level 45 so parking the stat somewhere in the middle of this range will be a good consideration without neglecting dexterity or the other stats. Now 
Now you'll have an incredibly powerful samurai build that you will just destroy every boss with. You can finish the entire game with this build easily. You'll look badass and the Nagakiba and Uchikatana combination is just too good. Attacking with both weapons at the same time is just going to deal so much damage. And on top of that, proc bleed really fast due to our dual wield setup and the infusions on our swords and our stat distributions. And with this you will just melt bosses and make quick work of any challenge that you're going to face in the game. Top that off with having two very powerful ashes of wars, one for slicing and one shotting everything in close range and one for when you need ranged options to nuke things that are far away from you. We also have good defenses so we can sustain battles easily while we destroy everything with our katanas. Finally, as always, in the late game more options will open up but for now we have a very powerful and fun build that you can make at the very start of the game. And really, with this build you can just finish the entire game and kill everyone easily. But I will make one follow-up video for the late game and go over all the extra options that unlock in the later parts of the game and make an alternative version of this build based on that. That video will be out soon. Thank you for watching, give the video a like and don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell thing as well so you are the first to get notified when I upload something and let me know your thoughts in the comments. What do you get if you combine two extremely powerful builds? Do you get something that's even more powerful? And what do you call a hybrid build based on having both intelligence and dexterity as your primary damaging stats? An in dex build, a dex int build, a spellblade, a battle mage, a mage with a sword, your mom? Well today I'm going to go over the most powerful intelligence and dexterity mix build that you can make right at the start of the game. When we hear in dex, a lot of people will automatically think about the moon build. Probably one of Elden Ring's most popular weapons because it's just that good and you can get it practically at the start of the game. But what if I told you that there is an even stronger type in dex build relying on a different weapon instead of the moon veil that you can make at the very start of the game but it's rarely ever mentioned and one of Elden Ring's most OP forgotten builds. And at the same time you can still use the moon veil in its most optimized form within this build and you can even use both weapons at the same time with great results which is why I will also showcase the moon veil in this video. Welcome to my samurai mage build, the absolute strongest in dex or spellblade build that you can make at the start of Elden Ring. This is my get op early guide for the prisoner. It's the class that fits the intelligence and dexterity hybrid build the most. As you start out with high levels for both of these stats, making it functionally and thematically the best class for a spellblade build. For your keepsake, you want to pick up the golden seed, it's just the best. An additional flask at the start of the game is just too good, especially if you use a lot of FP, which is definitely the case with builds that use sorceries. Now when you load in, you will see that you'll start out with a well-rounded kit. The prisoner is pretty much the intelligence-based counterpart of the fate-based confessor in terms of what you start out with. You get a shield, a very decent sword and a staff that does the job. Nothing too crazy, but overall just a very nice kit. The sorcery that the prisoner starts out with is in my opinion the best aspect though. The magic glint plate is just really that good, especially early on in the game. So definitely keep it in the roster of sorceries you want to use with this build. It has a delayed way of dealing damage to your enemy, which gives you the possibility to cast it tactically. So for example casting it preemptively and you will just get the damage in very reliably and safely like that. This also makes it possible for you to just destroy enemies that are much higher in level than you. But all of this combined is just not good enough. We definitely want to get the most out of a spell blade build and push it to a much higher level to truly unlock its power. The first thing you want to do is get your horse as always at the gate front side of Grace by talking to Melina and then go to the Dead Touch Catacombs to get our first main weapon. In the Dead Touch Catacombs you want to keep moving forward in the dungeon all the way till you get to the other side to pull the lever. Ignore all the skeletons while you're here and if you die it doesn't matter because the grace is very close by and it's still the start of the game. Then when you have pulled the lever down, go back to the entrance and near the grace an otherwise closed corridor will now be open for you to go through. 
when you go to the now open entrance you will also see a body laying there that you can loot and when you loot this body, you will get the Uchi Katana. The Uchi Katana is just a really powerful katana and you will see why it fits the build very well in a bit. Now that you have the Uchi Katana, you want to go and do the basics to get OP early. If you know, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. But I will quickly go over it so the new players that watch this video also know what I'm talking about. First of all, you want to get the Golden Pickled Fowl food right here in Limgrave. But when you have done so, go to the third church of America, pick up the goodies that are laying around here for you to pick up and then go beyond the church and take the teleport. This will teleport you to exactly here on the map and you want to go south till you reach Fort Ferret. That's this spot on the map. Ignore all the enemies on the route to the fort, no matter how big they are. And when you arrive at Fort Ferret, you want to pick up a very nice talisman. You want to ignore all the bats while you're running inside and move towards the ladder. Just run, climb up and then pick up the Dactus Medallion. This is very important so don't forget to do that. Then keep moving till you get to the second gap and jump down. Move to the right of yours, pick up the golden rune that's laying around there and then jump to the sneaky pathway to your right. Keep moving till you can jump down again and there will be the Radican Source Heal. If you're not familiar with this talisman, it's a very good talisman that will help us out because it provides a lot of relevant stats right at the start of the game. Then go outside, kill Griel, the big ass dragon. Now with the Uchi Katana, which is going to be one of our main weapons, you can proc bleed and kill Grail really fast. Doing so will give you a bunch of runes. Don't forget to pop the Golden Pickled Foul Food right before he dies, so you get an additional 30% in runes when you kill him. Now with these runes and for the first levels, you definitely want to invest a good bit into Vigor, something like this, and it will get boosted with another 5 points with the Sword Shield. And then get 18 dexterity and put all the rest of the points into intelligence. This is an int dex build. Intelligence is named first for a reason because intelligence is the more important stat as the weapons we will use have a higher scaling with intelligence and our sorceries and ashes of wars will solely scale with intelligence so you will always want to prioritize putting more points into intelligence compared to dexterity especially at these levels. Dexterity however will help out with casting faster and at the later stages in the game will complement the remainder of your levels to maximize your damage output when you start getting into soft cap territory for intelligence as this is a hybrid build you definitely do want to make use of them both at high levels but we'll get into that later on. Now with these stat distributions you'll have a good tanky basis thanks to our investment in Vigor and that is really nice for a spellblade build considering you will be in melee territory a lot of the time with this build. At the same time we don't neglect our damage stats at all and have a good distribution in terms of how you divide your points between intelligence and dexterity. Now we really just want to start working on actually making the build in terms of sorceries and weapons and ashes of wars. First of all we really just want to get the meteorite staff and it's close by thankfully. It is the best early game staff without a doubt. Go to the dragon burnt runes in Limgrave, take the teleporter chest that you'll find there, then escape the tunnel it teleports you to by just running out. Make sure to get the grace and keep running away. Until you get around here. First of all you will find a staircase and you will definitely want to go down there and it will lead you to the great rock sink spell. Definitely pick that thing up because it is one of the best spells that you can pick up at the start of the game. It deals great damage and it also deals great poise damage meaning you will have a nice tool to stance break your opponents relatively easily. Near the spot you will also find the meteorite staff laying around here exactly here pick it up because that is without a doubt the best staff that you can pick up at the start of the game the reason of this is that the meteorite staff has a very high scaling a s tier scaling right from the get-go you don't have to go through any effort to upgrade it as you can't even upgrade it in the first place but right from the start you'll have a staff with amazing scaling so your sorceries will deal a lot more damage it also boosts gravity sorceries and thankfully we just picked up a gravity sorcery that is probably also the best gravity sorcery in the game now rock sling is going to be our sorcery for when we want to hit stuff from a large distance this gives is an additional option as a spell blade as pretty much every spell blade related sorcery is just in melee range so this is a very nice sorcery to complement the rest of the build with now let's work on the spell blade side of things first of all you want to get some more powerful sorceries some easy to get and definitely powerful spells are the ones you get from the royal house scroll found in limgrave right here Turning the scroll in at any of your favorite sorcerers will grant you the possibility to buy Carrion Slicer 
and glint blade phalanx. Carrion slicer is very nice, it costs very little FP and does great damage for it in return, making it one of the most efficient spells in the game. It also just hits your opponents very fast and staggers them with great damage and with that you can just usually chain cast this and kill a lot of mobs with it by just spamming the spell. The other spell glint blade phalanx is a nice early game defensive option as you can preemptively cast it and have like a defensive magic spell guarding you to then deal good damage when a enemy approaches you. It's also nice when you're facing aggressive enemies that just don't give you the time to cast normal sorceries. You can then cast a spell far away from them or when you're like just running away or turn the opposite direction and then get the damage in reliably when you go near your enemy afterwards like that. Now these two spells are nice options and I've covered them before but it's time to go to the next level and get the trophy of the build. For this you want to go to Carrion Manor in the northern part of Lurnia you can access Lurnia without going through Stormville like this. Then when you're in Lurnia, you want to go to this spot right here. In Carrion Manor, first of all, a spell that fits an index build very well can be found near the entrance. You just want to keep going east when you're at the entrance. Ignore the hands as much as you can till you finally arrive at the Scarab. Kill the Scarab and it will grant you the Carrion Piercer Sorcery. This sorcery is very nice and you'll want to use it as your hard hitting poke spell. You can charge it and it has a nice reach, you can just poke enemies from a safe distance with it while dealing great damage or just finish them off reliably like that. You definitely want to have this sorcery in your roster as a spellblade. But the main reason we actually came to carry a manor is found when you progress through this place all the way till you reach the upper levels grace. Here you want to keep going forward and move up the stairs past the giant, you can walk around him if you don't want to go right through him. Then move upwards all the way till you see a gap to your left. Go through the gap and you'll see some jars, go in their direction and keep just jumping and jumping and jumping down until you see an item shining in the distance. Now go ahead and grab that thing because this is the Carrion Grandeur Ash of War. Probably the strongest magic Ash of War in the game and you'll see why in a second. Now that you have the Ash of War you want to put it on your Uchi Katana and your Uchi Katana will now have magic damage and scale with intelligence, making it a very good weapon for an intelligence based build. And now it also has a beast of an Ash of War. So the Uchi Katana is already a very good weapon thanks to its Katana moveset, great range and damage. It also has built in bleed, so you proc bleed on your enemies when you hit them with the sword a few times in a row and deal massive damage that way. And finally its flexibility is also really nice, you can modify it with all kinds of different affinities and put a lot of Ashes of Wars in it. That's why it's just a really nice contender for putting Carrion Grandeur on it. And it has one more benefit I'll talk about later on in the video. Now I called Carrion Granger the trophy of the build and it is an absolute monster of an Ash of War that a lot of people have slept on. It deals some of the highest damage that you will ever possibly see on bosses. And it's an Ash of War that you can get right at the start of a new playthrough. And this damage is without any of the 800 buffs in the game. We're just using the flask and the pure damage of the Ash of War with very low stats. Just the levels we got from killing Grail. And now you already see the potential this Ash of War has. And it only gets better when you actually progress in the game and start getting stronger with talismans, gear, more levels and so forth. So Carrion Grandeur has 3 levels of charging basically, giving you a lot of flexibility in how you want to cast it. The longer you charge it, the bigger the sword gets and the higher your damage will be. But in a lot of situations you'll only need the first level of charge and that one already deals a lot of damage and charges very fast. It will also just smash mobs into the ground, giving you a lot of breathing room in combat and just chain cast the spell basically. Versus bosses, you definitely want to get it charged all the way when you get the opportunity to do so and just smack them with it. It will take a massive chunk of their HP bar with just one swing of this magic sword. If you feel like you won't be able to charge it up all the way because the enemy is going to hit or stagger you soon, then you can just adapt to the situation because the Ash of War is very flexible and instead release the button quickly, use its first or second level of charge, hit them with that and still get great damage in. Thanks to its flexibility and the massive damage ceiling, it's just too good. And it will also just straight up out damage the Moonvale's Ash of War, almost with double the damage with the exact same stats and upgrades to both respective swords. Even the first charge will deal more damage than the Moonvale's Ash of War. 
Now with Carrion Grander you can do some insane combos. Something I didn't mention is that Carrion Grander in itself has great poise damage so you can easily stance break enemies with it. But a really nice combo is to combine it with Rock Sling. While your enemy is in the distance and moving towards you, you cast a few Rock Slings so you basically poise break them. Because like I said earlier, Rock Sling has very nice poise damage. Then when your enemy's stance is broken, you wanna follow it up with a fully charged Carrion Grander. And because Carrion Grander gets a bonus and hits even harder when your opponent is stance broken, it will deal massive damage and pretty much just function as an executioner for you. For another really nice combo we want to pick up another sorcery that you'll also want to add to the roster. This is the Great Blade Phalanx sorcery that you can pick up on route to Carrion Manor where we picked up Carrion Grander right here. You'll have to defeat a boss for it but with some swings with Carrion Grander it should be relatively easy. Now the Great Blade Phalanx is basically the same idea as the Glint Blade Phalanx but you really don't want to use the Great Blade Phalanx for its damage output because it's just simply way too FP inefficient for that but you definitely want to use it for its stance breaking ability and use it as the first part of a combo because when the blades of Great Blade Phalanx hit your enemies the blades will in fact occupy your opponent in the sense that they'll get staggered and won't be able to attack you meaning that in this very moment you get all the time to start charging up Carrion Grander all the way till it's fully charged and smash your opponents with it completely obliterating them with it don't be surprised if you'll just straight up one shot bosses like this that's how massive your dick will get with carrion grandeur now if you have made it till this point in the video then that can only mean one thing you like the video so hit that like button and if you're still not subscribed to me then this is the moment hit that subscribe button you know you want to do it now just a few things before you continue making the build even stronger. If you're familiar with my previous videos then you know I invented a method that will get your weapon that uses normal smithing stones all the way to plus 16 by just going to two places in the game. You can also do that for the magical Uchi Katana with carrying grander or you can just naturally progress the sword and upgrade it. It is up to you. Getting your sword to plus 16 is really easy though especially with carrying grander and with my method. As you see, I defeat the Crystallion, which is the only boss you need to defeat to unlock the method to upgrade your sword all the way to plus 16, very easily with Carrion Grandeur's Poise Break and Insane Damage. And mind you, this is with a unupgraded plus zero Uchi Katana, so the sword is in its base form. And whether you want to upgrade your Uchi Katana plus Carrion Grandeur and to exactly which level is up to you, I'll put the method for getting it all the way to plus 16 in the description. Now I also mentioned the Moonville at the start of the video and it would be weird not mentioning it in a index build considering all things. The great thing is however that this popular weapon fits this build very well because you'll want to run the Moonville with exactly the same stats and setup. So this means this is basically a 2 in 1 build but it gets even better because our Uchi Katana is a Katana as well. This means that you can power sense both the Moonville and the Uchi Katana and get a bleed Katana build that is skilled through intelligence and magic damage and dexterity right at the start of the game making this build pretty much a three-way type of build. This adds an additional layer to an already incredibly powerful build and what this really means is that when you just want to switch it up for a certain area because you don't want to use sorceries for example or you just feel like slashing things with katanas for a bit in that area or you're fighting versus things with a lot of magic resistance you equip both katanas and just power stance and attack your opponents like that instead of using your staff for those fights. With the bleed procs you will just completely decimate your opponents and because intelligence will always be high for us our katanas will both deal very nice damage. And to add another layer to that you can also switch it up between your moonville and uchi katana by having both of these weapons in your main hand during battle. So you get another option in the ash of wars you can use while still holding your staff and all of these things just makes the build extremely adaptable and gives it a ton of variety which makes the build a lot of fun. Now you can get the Moonville in the Gale Tunnel by killing the Magma Worm right here. Killing Magma Worm is quite easy with yet again Carrion Grander. You just stance break this worm then accordingly hit him with Carrion Grander and then you'll just ask yourself one question. Where did this guy's HP bar go? After killing the Magma Worm you will get the Moonville. The Moonville's main selling point is basically its Ash of War. It's just really good. The Ash of War can be cast as either a horizontal or a vertical slash basically to attack your opponents with it and both deal great damage versus both bosses and packs of mobs and you just want to use whichever variation you want depending on how the enemies are standing in front of you or how far they are from you. The vertical slash has the longer range of the two. 
the Moonwell's Ash of War won't deal more damage than Carrion Grandeur as I showed you before, but it's a very nice alternative option as the Moonlight from the Ash of War comes out very fast and it's just extremely easy to hit any opponent in the game with it and you can just spam it as well. That's why it's also that popular and also really hated by a lot of people at the same time. But it's definitely one of the best index weapons in the game. Now that you have the Moonville and the magical Carrion Grandeur based Uchi Katana, if you followed my upgrade route for the Uchi Katana, you will have it at plus 16, and you can do the same thing to the Moonville basically, but in that case, with using Somber Smithing Stones, you can buy Somber Smithing Stone 1 to 4 for relatively cheap by talking to Ichi. Again, on the road to Caria Manor, he's right next to the Grace right here, so it is easy peasy lemon squeezy getting your Moonville to plus 4. Then you can also get a Somber Smithing Stone 5 by going back to the Celia Crystal Tunnel, the tunnel we teleported to by using the teleporter chest earlier on in this video to get our staff. Go outside of the tunnel, mount up and basically keep moving forward while hugging the right side of this area till you get to exactly this opening. Go to the right here and make your way to the end of the path where you will find the Somber Smithing Stone number 5. There is also a Somber Smithing Stone number 6 in the Celia Crystal Tunnel itself. You'll have to progress and move up and down various times. Ignore or kill off all the annoying ass enemies in this cave. Whatever you want to do, but just keep progressing till you get to the boss in this room exactly. Defeat the boss, it should again be not too hard with carrying grandeur. The Ash War just can't do it all. But if you struggle with any of these bosses, you can always just use Spirit Ashes to make it easier. And that is a really good tip for beginner players. If you want to make this insanely OP build even more OP, get Spirit Ashes, summon them while fighting and let them tank for you while you cast your sorceries, Ashes of Wars and attack with your weapon. It will be the easiest time of your life like that and you will just completely destroy the game. After killing the boss, you will now get Somber Smithing Stone 6 and this means that with all the previous stones and this stone, you can upgrade your Moonville all the way to plus 6 and this is more than enough for now. You can go even beyond that if you really want, but it's really not worth the hassle in my opinion. Now you'll have a plus 6 Moonville and a plus 16 Uchi Katana and a S plus tier staff. And you are now the strongest spell blade that has ever existed. So let's now talk a bit about the flask gear and talismans that you want to run with this build. For the flask, it is a no-brainer. You want to get the intelligence snort. It gives a boost to intelligence, a whopping plus 10 to the intelligence stat, which is very nice this early on. You can find this crystal tier here, right outside of Carrier Manor, the place you'll have to go to anyways for Carrying Grandeur, so that is very convenient. It is right here for you to pick up. Then for the other crystal tier for the flask, you just want to pick up the, the Magic Surrounding Crack tier by defeating the Earth Tree Avatar near the Earth Tree in the northern part of Lurnia. It is basically on the other side. This Earth Tree is extremely tanky and hits very hard, and it's definitely not something you usually defeat this early on in the game. But like I said, and I think you get it by now, nothing is impossible with Carrion Grandeur. Just look at that insane damage. If you have difficulties defeating him, then you can also just keep distance and spam Rock Sling and you'll defeat him like that instead. When you defeat him, you will get the Magic Shrouding Crack tier, which will increase the damage of all our magic, so our Ashes of Wars, our magic damage on our weapons and our sorceries, all with a whopping plus 20%. So this Crystal tier is a no-brainer as well. Mix both Crystal tiers in the flask and start using that thing. For gear, you don't really have to worry about it in the early game. Just play the game and as you progress through the game and do some quests, you will unlock the possibility to get the Spellblade set. When you have done so, you definitely want to equip this set as each piece of the set will increase the damage output of Carrion Grandeur. For the second talisman, you'll want to go to the Altus Plateau region and definitely want to get the Godfrey icon as soon as you can. Considering we have multiple chargeable sorceries and more importantly Carrion Grander, this thing will make our damage output even better. You want to go to this place specifically and kill the boss there. The boss is again very tanky and definitely not an early game boss at all, but with how OP my build is, you should be able to destroy him as well and get that second talisman to make Carrion Grander hit even harder. Now this is not all, this video will have a follow up where the Spellblade or my Samurai Mage gets a twist and becomes a different character based on things that unlock in the later parts of the game that will be the late game version of this build. For now you have the strongest possible index build that you can possibly make at the start of the game that also has a lot of variety in it as well which makes it so much fun and you can already just destroy the entire game with my Spellblade build like this but definitely stay tuned for my follow up video, you don't want to miss it.
Paladins are holy warriors, meant to bring justice to the unjust and to extinguish evil from the darkest corners of the world. These holy warriors have high damage through means of using hard to think large weapons combined with infinite sustain because they have the ability to heal their wounds and their allies and grant themselves a full HP bar at all times so they can confront the toughest of foes like it's nothing. The Paladin is blessed by the Earth Tree and through these blessings has also been gifted with the capabilities of using various holy light and retribution related magic. Today I will show you the most powerful paladin build in Eldering and the best thing is is that you can make this build at the very start of the game. This is going to be my rendition of a strength and fate mix build. Before you continue make sure to hit that subscribe button because we are almost at the magic number 69,000 and we need to get that as soon as possible and if we are already past that then the next goal is going to be 69 million so hit that subscribe button and give the video a like don't forget to do that and let's go and continue with the video so for the starting class thematically the best option is going to be the confessor when you're picking a class as the class starts out with a good number of points in both of these stats for keepsake the golden seed is always good and in this case it's going to be good as well having an extra flask at the start of the game is just really nice the confessor starts off with a basic but definitely an all-around kit that is very functional you get a sword a shield and a decent seal to cast incantations and you also get two pretty useless incantations basically you have something of everything and that is nice but the faster we start working on our desired setup the better so that's exactly what we're going to do for this build we're going to do something that has never been done before on youtube and definitely not on my channel we're going to go to this weird place called Kaelid at the very start of the game shocking but before we go there we want to get our mount from melania at the gate from rune side of grace then we want to pick up a golden pickled fowl food right here in limgrave and the Morningstar weapon right here in the Weeping Peninsula area. I'll tell you why we're doing all these absurd things in a second. But when you have done so, go to the third church of America, pick up the goodies that are laying around here for you to pick up, and then go beyond the church and take the teleport. This will teleport you to exactly here on the map, and you want to go south till you reach Fort Ferret. That's this spot on the map. Ignore all the enemies on the route to the fort, no matter how big they are. And when you arrive at Fort Ferret, you want to pick up a very nice talisman. You want to ignore all the bats while you're running inside and move towards the ladder. Just run, climb up and then pick up the Dactus Medallion. This is very important, so don't forget to do that. Then keep moving till you get to the second gap and jump down. Move to the right of yours, pick up the golden rune that's laying around there and then jump to the sneaky pathway to your right. Keep moving till you can jump down again and there will be the Radican Source Heal. If you're not familiar with this talisman, it's a very good talisman that will help us out because it provides a lot of relevant stats right at the start of the game. Then go outside. Kill Grail, the big ass dragon, with your Morningstar weapon equipped so you proc bleed and kill him quickly. When the dragon is almost dead, make sure to pop the golden pickled fowl food that we just picked up so we get a bunch of extra runes. Now you'll have a bunch of runes and it's just really a nice way to get a good start as it's pretty much free. Now that we have done the standard get OP early stuff, we can start with the actual build. Make sure to also use the golden rune that you picked up inside the fort as well, then go level up. For the start of this build you want to spend 1 point in Fate, 3 points in Mind and put all the rest in Vigor, so that's like 22 points in Vigor. The more Vigor you have with this build the more profit it's going to give us in a bit. You'll see why in a second so that's why we're going crazy with putting points into Vigor. Now go to Fort Hyde in Limgrave, you want to go to the top of this fort as well, ignore all enemies, you are already very tanky now due to the points spent in Vigor, so even if you get hit a few times it doesn't matter that much. But at the top of this fort pick up the left part of the Dex Medallion. Now the real power of the paladin lies in the Altus Plateau region. You can definitely see that the paladins have originated from this region with how various areas in this region look and really have that paladin aesthetic going on. It's very golden and yellowish. It was built by paladins and therefore it is definitely the paladins hometown. And I totally made all of that up but with all the three sentinels around in this area we can definitely make that the background story. Anyways go back to Limgrave, go to Lurnia and bypass Stormville. You don't need to defeat any bosses to go to the Altus Plateau region then move towards the lift in the northeastern part of Lurnia use the medallion at the lift and you'll have access to the Altus Plateau region in this region there's a lot of good stuff for a paladin and you want to pick up multiple things first of all let's pick up our main ash of war this one is an easy pickup just move towards the capital but ultimately follow this path that's being drawn out on the map and get to this spot 
Make sure to also get all the graces on the route so it gets easier later on. When you get here, there will be an invisible scarab roaming the area and when you get a chance to hit it, it will give you the prayerful strike Ash of War. This Ash of War is incredibly powerful and I'm going to show you why in a second. But we need to go and pick up our main weapon first as well before we do that. The main weapon that you'll want to pick up is in the northern part of the Alts Plateau region. So for that, go to this spot on the map and use the teleport. You'll end up exactly here and you can go and now pick up the weapon. The weapon is guarded by a lot of enemies. But it doesn't matter, you just want to go towards the chest in the carriage and interact with it and you will get the weapon. This may be a suicide mission for you but you can also try to escape, it should be relatively easy to do so. Whatever you do, just make sure to get the weapon, that is the number one priority. And if you get it, then mission accomplished. Before I go into the weapon and the Ash of War, since we are going to be invested a lot in the Fate set, you'll also want to pick up the Golden Vow spell. It's really close to where we picked up Great Sars. From here, you just want to move something like this, and you'll end up at the Corpse Stench Shack, and you can pick up that spell as well. Golden Vow is a really good pickup that you can get at the very start of the game, as you can see, and it will buff our damage output as well as raise our defenses every time we use it. So then we get it as well. Now let's get into the absolute monster weapon we just picked up. Great Stars is just a very powerful weapon and you can pick it up right at the start of the game as you see. And what makes this weapon so good is that it has incredible damage output but it also has a lot of poise damage to stance break your enemies. It's a great hammer, it looks epic, it has a good size and does a nice range to just smack everything around you with it. It has a great moveset and it just feels very smooth to use and nice when you hit things with it. The weapon also fits the Paladin team very well because every single time you hit an enemy with it, it will restore HP for you based on a percentage so the more vigor you have the more HP you will restore which is really nice and if you hit multiple enemies at the same time with its large range it will stack as well so you will get multiple procs of getting your HP back. To top it off if you thought that was all well no because it also has the most powerful status effect built in bleed so as you hit enemies you will also proc blood loss on enemies. The weapon just has it all. And then the Ash of War we picked up, Prayerful Strike, is the most Paladin-esque Ash of War in the game. And thankfully it is not just there for the team, because it is in fact extremely powerful. <laughs> Apply it to Great Source and give it the Sacred Affinity. This will be important and you will see why later on in this video. Prayerful Strike basically gives you infinite sustain. Every time you hit something with it, it restores 30% of your HP for you. So again, the more Vigor, the more HP you will restore. And now you know why you went so heavy on Vigor right off the bat. And that is not all, because it actually has very good poise damage built in as well. And it smacks a lot of enemies in the game completely into the ground. Or just one shots them. Or does both of these things at the same time. It's very satisfying to use. And all the HP you restore with it makes this a very powerful way to play the game. Because basically any mob in the game is just a buffer for you to get your HP back. And against bosses you can just keep restoring your HP throughout the entire fight. So I'm going to fight Margit right now. But I will face tank every single hit from him and not touch anything. So play as reckless as possible essentially. Margit can be as much of a rabbit dog as he wants to be. But it doesn't face me at all. Because every time you use prayerful strike it will deal great damage. But also look at the HP bar. You get a massive chunk of HP back every time you use this. Ash of War. And you can keep doing this over and over and over and over just to make sure that you will never die but also are actually destroying whatever you're fighting at the same time. And that's why this combination is just so good. This incredibly powerful combination of Great Stars and Prayerful Strike is going to be the core idea of my Paladin build. When using Prayerful Strike you also get a bunch of Hyper Armor so you rarely get interrupted when casting it and even if the enemy goes completely ham on you, you will still get it off which is extremely important as well. But like I said, this is not all, because Great Sars in itself already deals great damage, so you can use its moveset and unique characteristics outside of the Ash of War to just destroy whatever you're fighting as well. Now before we continue with the build, it's time to upgrade our weapons, and if you're familiar with my previous videos, then you know that we can upgrade our weapons to a very high level at the start of the game. First of all, you want to go to the Uriah Lucaria Crystal Tunnel in Lernia, 
go all the way to the bottom of this cave and fight the boss right there. Defeat him with Great Stars. It should be an easy fight with all the poise damage that the Great Star has. Then you will get the Somber Stone, Miner's Bell, Bearing to buy Smithing Stone 1 and 2. After that you want to go to the Seal Tunnel in Elts Plateau. Since you already got a bunch of graces here, you'll probably get here quite fast. In the Seal Tunnel, hit the Hidden Wall, go to the chest and pick up the second Bell Bearing to give you the possibility to buy Smithing Stone 3 and 4. Then you want to start farming the miners here. Again, it should be really easy with the Great Source weapon as it has crazy damage and poise damage. Do this until you have 12 smithing stone number 5. Make also sure to upgrade your weapons in the meantime while you're farming them so the farm gets even faster. At some point you will just literally one shot these making it an extremely fast farm. And there are also nodes in this area that spawn smithing stone number 5 so look out for those as well. When you have farmed enough smithing stone number 5s, move through the cave some more while hitting more of the hidden walls here. And eventually you will want to drop down to the room with the big abductor thing. Go to the, I don't know what it is, but it has light radiating from its structure. Lure the abductor to it. And when he moves towards you and hits the structure, he will break it open. And it will make it possible for you to loot 3 more smithing stones. This time it's a smithing stone number 6. So now with all these smithing stones, you will be able to upgrade your great stars weapon all the way to level 16 at the very start of the game. Yes, if that's not a good start then what is? Now that we've worked on our weapon and Ash of War, we're going to work on the magic side of the Paladin. As we will be spec deep into Fate, it will be a really nice way to make a hybrid strength and Fate build and it would be a way to not pick up some incantations with all those points in Fate scaling our damage. For this you want to go to this spot exactly near the artist shack race, there will be a knight patrolling the area, kill him and he'll drop a prayer book that you can turn in at the giant ass turtle at the church of vows, afterwards you'll be able to buy honed bolt and lightning spear, lightning spear is going to be your ultimate ranged option as a paladin, it has a really good range and it's just really useful as an option to hit things that are really far away. And then Honed Bolt is one of the most Paladin-esque looking spells in the game. It really gives off that retribution vibe with how you cast it and then striking the enemy from the sky. And outside of it looking really cool, it's also just a really useful spell because you can use it as a faster ranged option with more accuracy to hit your enemies to bridge the distance while they're moving towards you because you can just spam it. And with that, it will just deal quick damage to whatever you're fighting at that moment. After doing this you want to pick up two earth tree incantations that are both very good as well. These are both the aspects of the crucible horns and tails incantations. You can get the horns incantation in Stormville, you need to go to the Rampart Tower Grace and then move along the birds, drop down till you get all the way down and fight the Crucible Knight there, he will drop it for you when you defeat him. Then the Tails incantation you can get at the Stormhill Evergoal right here. You'll have to defeat another Crucible Knight right here and these knights have high armor and can combo you down real quick if you don't pay attention. So be careful with that but after killing him he will give you the incantation as well. The Tails aspect is nice because it hits your opponent twice in a row basically and the second swipe will also poise break whatever you're fighting and it's just a nice extra melee AoE option as a paladin. Then the horns aspect is a good damage dealer as well and it's going to function as a bridge between the ranged aspect and the melee aspect of the paladin. You can use it to get quickly to an enemy and start smashing them. You can also do really nice combos with it. For example use horns into a prayerful strike to get a nice quick and useful combo. Or you could use horns into tails for an alternative combo that will hit really hard as well and is another nice option to consider. And finally you can also pick up flame grant me strength right here as another buff option to use with golden vow. It's nice and it will make your weapon hit even harder. You can pick up all of these incantations at the start of the game so definitely go for it. And if you don't give a rat's ass about sticking to the paladin team and you're not a true role player then check out my other builds that revolve around other powerful incantations to potentially use on this build because in reality you can use whatever incantation you want obviously because you have the specs but that's a choice for you to make. I will put the links for these builds in the description so you can check that out as well. Now with the method I showed you, you can also get your seal all the way to plus 15 really easily and then you'll have a plus 16 main weapon and a plus 15 seal for having the ultimate start as a paladin. 
Now you can use all of this stuff to completely destroy whatever you're fighting. You can play like I showed you before, just keep healing yourself, but you have a lot of tools with this build and everything is going to hit hard for you. So that's also how I recommend you to play my Paladin build because it is a really good and versatile build. Now after you defeat Margit, you'll unlock the second talisman slot. And for this you will want to pick up the Sacred Scorpion Charm in the Smoldering Church in Kaelid. You will get invaded here, but it's a really easy fight with our setup. This poor invader doesn't even have a 1 million chance against us. When you defeat the invader, you will get the talisman and this talisman will raise our holy damage. Which is nice because both our Ash of War as well as our weapon will deal a lot of holy damage so it's a nice bonus. In a similar nature for our flask you want to pick up the holy crack tier from the earth tree avatar in northeastern Lernia. Close to the bridge you were just a moment ago to go to the alt plateau region. The earth tree avatar is however really tanky and more of like a mid game enemy so keep that in mind. We are still at the start of the game but yeah you can safely kill him with prayerful strike. Afterwards when you do so he will drop the holy crack tier for you and this is another increase to our damage output then you want to pick up the fate not crystal tier in the weeping peninsula area right here this is a no-brainer pickup we get plus 10 to our fate set with this at the start of the game every time you use our flask so that means more damage from both our incantations as well as our weapon the reason why i spent exactly one point into fate at the start of the game is because you will be at 25 exactly with the flask now and thus you can use golden vow at the very start of the game as well and that brings us to the next part stats for stats, I would highly recommend you in the next 5 levels to put those 5 points all into strength so you can start using the Great Sarge weapon one handed. Otherwise you have to always use a two handed which is more damage obviously for normal attacks but then you have to swap every time between your seal and weapon which can be a bit tedious. So get that going for sure and after doing that you will want to prioritize getting 27 fate so you can cast all incantations without relying on the flask and get a nice bonus to our damage because we already are very very tanky at this moment in time so do that and then you'll just really want to start working towards this stat distribution get 50 fate 25 strength 50 vigor 25 endurance and 24 mind our weapon scales mostly with fate so get 50 fate to reach that first soft cap for fate when using weapons and to make our incantations hit even harder and then get 25 strength to fully meet the requirements of great stars without needing the radican sword shield and get the rest of that scaling damage for our weapon through strength there will be situations where you want to just only use your weapon and in those cases you can just two hand it giving you that nice 1.5 multiplier so 25 strength will then be equal to 38 strength and that is a nice extra bonus that you should consider using depending on if you only need your weapon or not then you definitely want 50 vigor so you get good value out of our ash of war and weapons hp restoring capabilities and just to be very tanky 25 endurance to give you a lot of extra stamina so you don't run out of stamina so fast when you're just chaining your weapon attacks and it gives you more possibilities for armor later on in the game because we went so deep into vigor we don't really need that much armor right now but it's definitely something you will want to pick up later on and then 24 mind to have enough fp so you don't quickly run out of mana when using incantations and your ash of war 24 mind will be more than enough for this purpose and i think you can pretty much just run fp flask mostly because you get all the hp you need with the ash of war so if you don't even need 24 mind you can also get 20 mind and then put the final four points into vigor as well for a level 100 50 build i would definitely suggest getting 60 figure to get even more value out of prayerful strike and then just put the rest into fate and strength to get even more damage Now with this build you just have it all, both ranged and melee hard hitting and healing options all in one. When your enemy is in the distance you can start to fight through means of the paladin's powerful magic and then in melee range you can start using your main weapon which heals you, it deals massive damage and poise damage so you can easily stance break whatever you're fighting and you have infinite sustain through your prayerful strike which with every use will heal you with a massive chunk of your HP while hitting your enemy really hard. Due to the hybrid nature of this build, it also allows for all kinds of very powerful and fun combos. 
with the optimization in this video you have good survivability and damage output and through the versatility of the build it's just a very fun and safe way to destroy the game. I hope you enjoyed this video. I might make a follow up video where we consider late game options and optimize for it. Let me know in the comments if you want that but for now we have an extremely powerful build that you can easily destroy the game with. If you liked the video leave a like that helps out a lot. Make sure that you've pressed the subscribe button and also hit the bell thing so you're the first to get notified when I upload something and leave your thoughts in the comments. The wretch has no real identity, so we're going to go with a fan favorite build of mine here, and if you know, you know. A build so strong it trivializes the entire game. The captain is a monster, one might say, in the literal sense of the word. The captain represents quite possibly the strongest pure strength build that you'll ever see in Elden Ring, and you can make it right at the start of the game. Embracing a pure strength brutality mentality and just being this body filled with sheer endurance, there's nothing that can stop the captain, really. But there is something off about the captain. The captain's signature weapons are rather unorthodox weapons with which he brutally defeats his opponents. There is just something unnatural about the captain's weapons that make them hit so hard in the first place. Before the captain was a well-renowned fighter, he was the captain of a famous fleet until an event known as the Incident happened. Let's say however that it made sure that the captain hits his opponents with such force that health bars get melted with single swings of his weapons. This video will cover you for an entire playthrough, so early, mid and late game. This build is broken early on, but it's also broken late game. That tells you all you need to know about how good this build is. To make the captain the best choices for your starting class is either the hero or the vagabond. Both are great options and have the best stat distributions for this build. I went with the hero. It probably is better overall because we don't need the dexterity of the vagabond really. And the hero is the definition of pure strength. Pick the golden seed as your starting keepsake and let's get going. Now before we make the captain we want to get a horse and get a head start early on. Get a horse from Melina at the gate front side of Grace. Pick the Flask of Wonders Physic in Limgrave and make sure you kill Grail with a Golden Pickled Foul Food and the Morning Star in Kaelin. Make also sure to pick up both sides of the Dex Medallion. If you have never seen a video of mine and don't know what I just said or are new to Elden Ring, I will put a link in the description for the just mentioned steps so you know everything you need to know to do those steps completely correctly within like 2 minutes. Killing Grail correctly will net you around 100,000 runes and get you to level 36. With those runes, get these stats. I've tried out a bunch of stat distributions for level 36, but this one is the best. It's well rounded, makes you hit really hard and makes sure you fully meet the requirements of the weapons you want to use while having amazing sustain with vigor and endurance. After getting your stats up to par, it is time to pick up our main weapon. For this, you want to go to the Weeping Peninsula. It is pretty close to the starting area, just go south until you can go to the west pretty much. You ultimately want to arrive at the Morn Tunnel right here. When you get into the Morn Tunnel, go through it, basically you can ignore everything in it, until you get to the boss. And if you choose the hero, you can just brute force this boss using the hero's starting weapon. See, the hero's starting weapon has wild strikes. It already gives you an indication of how powerful this Ash of War is. That is nice because this Ash of War is even better with our main weapon that we will pick up in a second, which is the Rusted Anchor, and the Skelly Misbegotten will drop it right for you after you kill him. How convenient. The Rusted Anchor is in its most unoptimized and unupgraded form already really good. You can just straight up destroy everything right from the get go with this weapon, and it feels really nice to swing this great axe while having a nice hard punch to it when you actually hit things with it. It's a really fun weapon. But we need Wild Strikes on it to make it complete. Thankfully you can get Wild Strikes in Limgrave as well. It's very easy to get near the Stormhill Shack side of Grace. Follow up the road till you see the Scarab and then kill the Scarab and you'll get Wild Strikes. Put Wild Strikes on your weapon and you're a monster now. Wild Strikes recently also got a buff by the way, making it even better than it already was. But we're definitely not done yet. Near the Wild Strikes Ash of War, there is the Strength Knot Crystal Tier. It's right around the corner, really. It's our first main Crystal Tier. It gives 10 levels to our Strength stat, so make sure to loot it, because we're going to use it for our entire playthrough. Put it in your flask. 
Okay, so let me tell you a story about Great Axes. Great Axes had a great year through the patches. They got buffs multiple times even, making a Great Axe oriented playthrough now better than ever. When people think of pure strength builds, you usually see either colossal weapons or colossal swords. I made those videos as well. Check them out as well if you for example want to get OP early with the Guts Greatsword, which is also a really fun and powerful weapon by the way, or if you want to use big hammers to stampede everything. Definitely just check out my other strength videos as well if you like the idea of strength in general. Links will be in the description. However, great axes are great as well and have very nice attributes to them that makes them shine in their own right. The rusted anchor stands out in this weapon class in particular just for the reason that its damage type is of the pierce type. Somehow this weapon deals pierce damage, even though if you look at it it's a bit hard to imagine how that would work really. Usually the pierce damage type is associated with spears and logically pointy stabby things while most great axes have the standard damage type. But this is great news and will definitely take this anomaly. Because it means it has both the benefits of spears and great axes at the same time. See, this means that we can run the spear talisman with the rusted anchor and make its damage output catapult to insanity with this talisman, making this a very unique weapon that also looks badass. Now first we want to pick up this talisman as our first talisman, for this we need to go to Lierny of the Lakes, just bypass Stormville like this and make sure to travel to the west while staying in the watery area. The location for the talisman is actually very close to the border between Limgrave and Lyurnia and while moving a bit to the west you will find the entrance to the lakeside crystal cave right here. Enter the cave and just progress through it till you see a chest. In that chest will be the talisman. I will talk about this talisman in a second. But first we need to upgrade our rusted anchor so we have the ultimate start as the captain. If you're familiar with my videos, you'll know exactly my method, but essentially what you want to do is go to the Raya Lucaria Crystal Tunnel, which is also in Lyurnia, it's right here. Drop down all the way to the bottom to kill the Crystallion. It is a bit of an annoying fight at the start, but just spam attacks till you break his armor. After you break his armor, just two hand the rusted anchor and use jump attacks to completely control the fight. You will absolutely destroy the crystalline that way and you'll get the bell bearing afterwards allowing you to buy smithing stone number one and two. After getting this bell bearing you want to go to the Alts Plateau region. You should have both sides of the decked medallion as I mentioned at the start of the video to enter this region. In the Alts Plateau region go to the seal tunnel, progress through the illusionary wall there and get to the chest to loot the second bell bearing. With this bell bearing you can buy smithing stone number three and number four getting you all the way to plus 12. Now you want to farm the miners here for smithing stone number fives. Kill, loot, reset the area until you have 12 smithing stone number fives. Then progress forwards and hit some more illusionary walls till you can drop down again. Here you will find a statue in the distance, lure the killing machine thingy towards it to destroy it and it will break open and give you three smithing stone number six. With all those smithing stones, the one you can buy and the one you just farmed and picked up, you will upgrade your rusted anchor all the way till plus 60. So let's talk a bit more about the Rusted Anchor and more generally speaking the art of pierce damage on a Great Axe. This weapon is an absolute monster, especially in the setup that I'm going to show you. Now we can approach combat in various ways with my setup. First we have the good old option of just using wild strikes and brute forcing yourself through the fight. Wild Strikes is an amazing Asher 4, especially on this weapon. It works, your damage output will be bonkers and with my setup you have so much sustain, nothing is going to stop you while you're destroying whatever you're fighting. So if you want to become the helicopter you've always dreamed of and just use Wild Strikes and completely obliterate the fight like that, you can easily do so as you see. One more thing to note about Wild Strikes is that at any point during the cast you can follow it up with a normal or heavy attack and you'll get this special type of attack accordingly that will deal great damage and great poise damage. So definitely keep that in mind as well for those situations where you just want to combo your Wild Strikes into this special type of attack. It's a really nice attack for a bunch of different situations. The second option is to actually actively utilize the Spear Talisman and Pierce damage. I said actively because with the Wild Strikes option you will also utilize this Talisman, but really without you knowing it, and I will talk about that later on in this video. But for option number two, see, if you normally hit your opponents, you will still deal great damage with my setup. But if you make sure to hit your opponents while they're trying to hit you, so when you actively see them engaging in an attack animation, and you hit them in that very same moment, you will get a bonus to your attack. 
Now, for piercing attacks, there's already a natural bonus, and this is due to the fact that when the enemy is in the process of attacking you, their pierce resistance stat goes down. So logically, when you use an attack that is specified as pierce damage, you will get a nice bonus if you hit them while they're trying to hit you. But it gets better, seeing as we just picked up the Spear Talisman. This talisman boosts this very specific interaction even more. This specific interaction is called a Trusting Weapon Counterattack Damage situation. So time your attacks correctly and you will get a massive bonus to your damage output as you see right here. It is about 50% extra damage just by hitting in the moments that your enemy is trying to hit you. It is also very fun to play around this very specific mechanic. So if you have beaten Elden Ring like 69 million times already and never tried this out then this might be your calling. With your attacks you will also deal great poise damage to your opponents to stance break them by the way. So accordingly you will get those juicy critical hits quite often as well and you know exactly how good those feel it is orgasm inducing you know what's juicy and feels good as well you pressing that like button and the subscribe button right right now if you still haven't yet you know you want to do it you made it to this point in the video for a reason am i right or am i right now i'll talk about why this setup is also a stance breaking monster in a second but first we need to pick up our second talisman and weapon after killing Margot, you'll get a second talisman slot, and thankfully close by right in Stormville is our next big boy talisman. You'll want to grab the claw talisman right there. This talisman boosts your jump attacks with a whopping plus 15%. Now great axes have a great jump attack to them, especially when power sensing, both in damage as well as in poise damage, so we definitely want to utilize those. We still have nothing in our offhand though, even better would really be to pair up our rusted anchor with another great axe that has pierce damage, so we can fully profit from those juicy pierce damage bonuses that we would then get for both of our weapons. But wait, there is no other great axe with pierce damage in the game, unfortunately, so maybe we have to say goodbye to that idea, or do we? Listen carefully to what I'm going to say next. Go to the Limgrave Tunnels, it's very close to the starting area. Kill the miners there over and over and over and over and over. If you want to have the best farm for this, go to the second tunnel after dropping down the elevator and get into this area with 5 miners exactly. Kill these miners and then jump down to get a quick merciless death to respawn quickly. You will activate a state of America that way. With this you will have an extremely fast farm. Now you might ask why are we doing such a random thing all of a sudden? Well we want a pickaxe, yes a pickaxe, you heard that right. The moment you see one of these miners drop one for you is the moment that you can leave your house and go outside and scream out of happiness. Because now we're complete. The pickaxe is an absolute monster just like the rusted anchor. Both weapons have insane scaling and the pickaxe has pierce damage as well and is a great axe. Wait, what? Wait, wait, what? what? It's not a bit it's it's not a great axe. What the hell are you talking about? Okay, the pickaxe is a great hammer, but for some reason it is actually treated like a great axe when you power stance it. So exactly when you combine it with another great axe like the rusted anchor. And nobody seems to know this secret as I've never really seen people use this, but you actually get the power stance great axe moveset. And guess what? Now we have weapons that do not look like great axes at all, but are actually considered great axes that deal pierce damage and have a great jump attack. Regarding the pickaxe, you can get it to plus 12 right away with the fact that we just got those bell bearings, so we can buy the upgrades to plus 12. And if you're feeling funky, you can go and farm some more smithing stone number 5s and get the pickaxe to plus 15 as well. In the limb grave tunnels, there are a bunch of smithing stone number 1s by the way, so if you want to spare some runes, make sure to use those for the first few upgrades for both of your weapons. Now what is great about power sensing these weapons is that all those bonuses that I just talked about will apply to both of them. And the Great Axe Power Sense Jump Attack comes out very fast actually. And time your jump attacks correctly and you now have a third way to completely destroy the fight. All these bonus modifiers will make sure your damage output spirals out of control. As you see, the damage you can do is incredible. A lot of the time you don't even have to actively pay attention with either wild strikes or your jump attacks like I hinted at earlier in this video as they come out very fast and thus you can spam them. 
Because you are spamming your attacks, you will naturally also use them during parts of combat where your enemy is actively attacking as well, leading into you proccing that juicy trusting weapon counter attack damage bonus over and over. Now the nice thing with all of this is that you now have the power stance, moveset and jump attacks with two very hard hitting weapons with great poise damage that function the same, but you also obviously still have the rusted anchor normal moveset and wild strikes. So you have an answer to any situation in combat really. And finally, one more thing I need to tell you is that you becoming a stance breaking monster means you will stance break your enemies quite often, surprise surprise. But I would actually recommend you to go for wild strikes when your enemy is stance broken instead of going for the critical hit. The reason for this is because wild strikes will in those situations usually lead into more damage overall. So definitely keep that in mind, but either option is good really. Now the final thing we cannot <laughs> forget about is the aesthetic of this build, because the aesthetic is amazing. Just power stancing this random rusty anchor and big axe looks so absurd, but it looks fantastic at the same time as well. With how so many different types of cool looking weapons got all of that shine in the course of the past year in Elden Ring, just having these Pretty mundane weapons perform so well and being fun has just something endearing about it. Now after getting two remembrances it is time to get your third talisman slot and for this talisman you'll want to get the winged sword insignia. Winged sword insignia can be found yet again very nearby as well, it is in the southern part of Lurnia. Go into the Stillwater Gave and progress towards the boss that is found there, it is going to be a very easy fight, poor guy doesn't know what hit him and you'll get that talisman. This talisman is incredible because with either wild strikes or just our power stance moveset we proc its final tier very quickly giving us that nice boost to our damage output which therefore will be like active 99% of the time in combat and with this talisman in possession you have the trifecta of incredibly good talismans for this build that you want to run all the way till the post capital part of your playthrough really. Our flask is going to consist out of the earlier mentioned strength knot crystal tier and the second crystal tier is going to be the stone barb crystal tier. You get this crystal tier from killing the earth tree avatar in the northeastern part of Kaelid. It will give 30% extra poise damage to use meaning we will stand break things even faster. It's incredibly useful especially in this setup. The earlier you get this crystal tier the better because this crystal tier in combination with the strength knot crystal tier makes up for the flash you'll want to run for your entire playthrough. As you saw we have a lot of different hits coming out quickly whether it's through wild strikes, our moveset or our power stance jump attacks so all of that will benefit greatly from this crystal tier and make stance breaking your enemies easy peasy. Just decide for yourself when you feel ready to take on this tree because he's not that easy even though you can reach him right at the start of the game but now you know at least what you'll want to aim for for your flask of wonders physic. The earlier you get it the better but if you struggle early on then you can also use the spiked crack tier as a temporarily viable replacement. This is also a useful crystal tier obtainable in Limgrave and will boost your charged attacks and then whenever you feel ready to take on this guy you can swap it out with the stone barb crystal tier. As you already saw from me killing Margit, Godric, Renala, you can just completely destroy everything there is to destroy in this game with this setup. I just killed Radon with just the runes I got from killing Grail. No summons, no nothing, just pure strength brutality and it shows you that nothing can stop the captain whatsoever and it tells you everything you need to know it's a build that holds up all the way till the final boss which you will see in a second there are some slight adjustments you want to make for the mid to late game mostly because we get some extra options and that is going to be the next part of this video For the late game you want to swap out the winged sword insignia for the upgraded version that you can get later on. It's the exact same principle but with even higher bonuses to your damage output. So definitely get the rotten winged sword insignia as a replacement. Like I mentioned before, definitely keep the claw and spirit talisman in there. You want to use them for your entire playthrough. They are too good with this setup. Then talisman slot number 4, you can go either offensive with the shard of Alexander that boosts wild strikes or defensive with the dragon crest great shield talisman. I went with the latter because the damage output is already insane and with Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman we just have even more sustain which is really nice. For the flask like I said it says exactly the same for your entire playthrough. Then for gear the only mandatory piece is the headpiece which gives you that beautiful pirate look. And for the rest I used fitting gear like blade set and the exile gauntlets to get a nice aesthetic going that also breaks that 50 poise threshold so we can trade favorably as much as possible in combat. Otherwise the raptors black feathers for your chest piece is also amazing actually because it will boost our jump attacks even more and that will lead to 
even higher damage numbers. It only doesn't have that much poise on it. So you have to swap around the gear pieces and you can't unfortunately wear the hat anymore if you want to break through the 50 poise threshold in that case. It is up to you, what do you prefer more? Now for stats, I beat the game on this build just on the lowest meta level, which is level 125. The build is already very strong on lower levels, purely because it's a pure strength build, so you can efficiently already reach very high damage numbers early on, especially if you start out as the hero. For a level 125 build, I recommend the following stats. We will fully soft cap on strength with our flask and we have amazing sustain because as you see we have a lot of vigor and endurance so we can get a lot of blows from our enemies at the same time while we're dishing out damage. And this build kinda promotes playing reckless and not fearing incoming hits as you want to get as many hits in as possible when the enemy is trying to attack you. In this case that sustain is just really nice because of that trusting weapon counter attack bonus damage that both our weapons have the opportunity of getting. With so much vigor and defensive aspects in our kit we will come out as the winner of those trades in a lot of situations and get those juicy counter attack bonus damage procs favorably and consistently. For higher levels I would just adjust it to your own needs like there's nothing really more you need than this what is shown on screen so everything higher is just going to be a bonus and up to preference. One more thing regarding the pickaxe, I would not care too much about its Ash of War early on in your playthrough because early game it's going to be complete domination for you with this insanely lethal combo of powerful weapons and playstyle. But as you progress through the game, you can pick up the Braggart's Roar Ash of War, which is tied to a certain questline. It will be an amazing pickup for this build. Since our pickaxe is in our offhand, we can actively use its Ash of War while using the Rusted Anchor, obviously. Unless we two-hand the pickaxe, of course. But we can use Braggart's Roar preemptively and it will give us bonuses to everything we desire. It gives us more sustain, more damage and better stamina recovery. Everything that fits exactly the idea of this build. And the best thing about this Ash of War is that it actually got buffed recently, making it a nicer option than it has ever been. So definitely make getting this Ash of War a mid-game priority for yourself. And with that my friends, you now know everything about making and playing the captain build yourself. As you saw from all the combat footage in this video, the captain is an absolute monster. And finally, the captain has gotten his revenge. The captain fears nothing, promotes a reckless playstyle and embodies pure strength perfectly. Every battle you face will just be your personal playground as the captain. With so many different options and ways to tackle every fight with this build, there is never a situation where you feel like you have no solution to the problem. No, every problem you'll face in the game, you will most definitely have a solution for with this build. And it's a very unique build in many ways, including the counter attack bonus damage mechanic that is quite unique, that you can actively fish for or just passively proc all the time, because the playstyle of the build allows for it. So even if you complete this game like a thousand times already, it might be a completely new experience for you. It is a very fun playstyle and a very powerful build. Enjoy playing my captain build. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're still not subscribed. Hit the bell thing so you're the first to get notified when I upload something and let me know your thoughts in the comments.